okay, I'll let you psych yourself over. Yeah, I need to. Like, that's what I need to do. Thank you. Oh, hello, Lindsay. How are you doing?
dad got more mileage out of the computer games that came over a computer than a kid ever did. Like, you look at the high score, it's like dad, 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 dad.
Good morning, everyone. It's Access, and we're all here in person. We're not all here in person. Some of us are online. So welcome to the people who are online. <laughs> um, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome you to Access 2020, uh, 2022. Oh my gosh. 2020 was the one that was supposed to happen in person and never did. So James Forney, if you are out there online, um, he was the lead organizer for Access 2020 <laughs> that started planning in person and had to switch to virtual. Um, so we are here, James. Yay. <laughs> um, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we are gathered physically this morning uh, is the traditional and unceded land of the Algonquin Nation. Um, our attendees on Zoom are also on Indigenous lands across the continent but they are able to join us because of the people and the technology that are here on unceded Algonquin land. Um, in the spirit of reconciliation, we want to seek to respect the cultures, the spirituality, the history, and also the current experiences of Indigenous peoples. So access is a little different this year, right? <laughs> um, it's our first truly hybrid conference. Um, so, as I said, we're really happy to welcome the folks in the room and the folks online on Zoom and the live stream. Um, because access has always been a little bit hybrid, right? Uh, because we've always had that live stream component. We were, we were doing it before it was cool. <laughs> we are the conference hipsters. Uh, truly. <laughs> um, but this year, instead of just streaming what's happening in the room, we have a mix of in-person speakers, we have uh, live speakers on Zoom, we have recorded speakers on Zoom. So it's a bit of a mix, it's a bit of an experiment, and like all good experiments, it may not always go quite according to plan, um, but in the words of our hometown prophet, Alanis Morissette, you live, you learn. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Please, we may ask you to be patient with us at times, uh, and we definitely welcome your feedback about how it's going. Um, so a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, platinum level sponsor, Carleton University Library, gold level sponsors, EBSCO and University of Ottawa Library, and silver level sponsors, Clarivate, who contributed towards the technology costs, and OCLC Canada, who contributed towards the Dave Binkley Memorial Lecture. We thank them all for helping to make the conference possible. Yay, sponsors. <laughs> yes, yes, applaud the sponsors. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we'd like to remind all attendees, remote and in person, that they're expected to follow the Access Code of Conduct. Um, you can find it on our website, and that link was emailed to all registrants in person and, uh, and remote. If you need to talk to a member of the organizing committee about something related to the code of conduct, um, you can do so in a couple of ways depending on how you're attending. So for the remote folks, we ask that you use uh, the Zoom chat. You can do a private chat with our Zoom moderator. Um, who maybe uh, can give a little, <laughs> I am here, <laughs> so they know, so you know uh, who you should private chat with. Um, the Zoom moderators are all members of the Access Organizing Committee, um, so it's the best way to reach us quickly. And for people in the room, again, the best way to get in touch with us quickly is to try to find a, uh, not try to find, is to find, <laughs> a conference organizer. We're all visible by our, our red lanyards and uh, green access buttons. And maybe some the folks who are in the room could just give a wave, stand up so people can see who their contacts are. Awesome. Thank you so much. If you're not comfortable talking to someone in person about a code of conduct issue, you can use the access email. Um, but I just want you to know it may take us a little longer to respond by email. We won't be checking it constantly. Um, okay, now we have some housekeeping bits and pieces. Uh, for in-person people, washrooms are just sort of across from the room here, down a little hallway. 
Um, and then there are some more down the giant staircase that you might have come up this morning, just at the bottom of that, of that staircase. In case of fire, <laughs> you can go down that giant staircase uh, and across the road to the green area there. Um, there's also another staircase on the way to the, the washrooms on this floor. So two different staircases you can use. It may seem silly that I'm doing this. I've been to uh, two conferences where the fire alarm has rung <laughs> in the middle of presentations. So it's very good that everybody knows where to go. Um, for remote folks, I can't help you with fire exits, but I'm feeling quite confident that the washrooms are where you last saw them. Um, okay, to try to keep things reasonably straightforward for our conveners as, and as our speakers are um, presenting, and also so we're not sharing microphones, we're not gonna be doing Q&A live in the room. Uh, we're managing all of the Q&A through Slido. Um, and so whether you're remote or in the room, we want you to type your questions into Slido and then we'll moderate them from there. Um, so we want to make sure that everybody knows how to get to Slido and is sort of comfortable with that. So we'll do a little practice before, uh, before we get started. So if you could grab a device if you have one. If you're in the room and don't have one, we have a laptop. Uh, over by Cameron is Vanna whiting it for us. Um, <laughs> so you can enter your questions there. Um, so if you could go to slido.com, S L I D O.com, um, and enter the code. Is the code maybe displayed for the, for, an, anyway, the code is hashtag access. And there should be a poll that you can see. Um, where are you joining us from this morning? And some folks are answering. We're seeing our little, there we go. There's the code and the everything set up there. Not surprisingly, Ottawa is, uh, <laughs> is a top answer. But lots of other folks coming from different places. Marvelous. It's nice to see. So you can keep answering but I will continue. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everybody knew Slido so they were able to ask questions um, because we are about to get <laughs> to the keynote. Um, and I would just like to remind folks in the room that we do ask that you stay masked for the keynote. So if you've been munching away on breakfast, if you could take a moment and just throw those masks back on um, and we will get the actual conference part of the conference started. So the tradition of the Dave Binkley Memorial Lecture began at the 2005 Access Conference in Edmonton. It was initiated by Gary Gibson of Gibson Library Connections in memory of Dave Binkley, who was one of the leading spirits in the early days of Access, and he had died earlier that year. Dave was a remarkable innovator in automated online services in his day. And it's marvelous that we are able to continue to remember him. So when Gary Gibson retired, OCLC Canada took up the mantle in 2018. Um, so please, if you could welcome Andy Spillo from OCLC Canada, who is here to introduce this year's Dave Binkley Memorial Lecture. Thank you so much, Andy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here to introduce Jordan. Jordan is the Digital Repositories Librarian at the University of Waterloo, a community building member of the Canadian Association of Research Libraries Open Repositories Working Group, and a former community coordinator for the maintainers. Uh, that's a place I, I strongly encourage you to check, a link I strongly encourage you to check out. Not too long ago in Jordan's first semester of library school, a professor told them they didn't know what space meant when they spoke about the actual physical space of libraries. The, that same week, they submitted their geography thesis. Since then, they spent a lot of time thinking and writing about library spaces and logistics. Then the pandemic hit. They didn't go outside for two years 
and their sense of space imploded. In this talk, Jordan will talk about how much more complicated and contested library space became since that awkward class discussion. So without further ado, please welcome Jordan. Thanks so much, Andy. And thank you to OCLC and Access and everyone for joining us here today. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, last time I came to, th this is my first IRL access, but in the pa I was very grateful to be um, named the third smartest goat at Access 2020 for knowing more answers to random trivia questions than all but two other goats. Um, I'm grateful to be here today as a guest on unceded Algonquin lands. And this paper was composed on lands covered by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Covenant, by the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples, and by the Williams Treaties and Treaty 13 with the Chippewas and the Mississaugas of the Credit. I live off the historical portage route known as Gete um, now known as Davenport Road, connecting the two major rivers of central Toronto, um, the Humber and the Don. And I work at the University of Waterloo, uh, located on the Haldeman Tract, the six miles on each side of the Grand River uh, promised to the Six Nations in 1784. Centuries of broken promises later, uh, the Six Nations control approximately 5% of what was rightfully theirs. And over the course of this talk, I do my best to connect libraries to land and think of what it means to be a respectful ally. I also acknowledge that reproductive justice and sexual health care is something extraordinarily lacking in the communities around where I work. Growing up in Toronto, in downtown Toronto in the late 90s, I was lucky to be able to access emergency contraception by taking a quick walk on my lunch break in high school. And I can tell you I would not be here today if not for my access to reproductive health care. So I am donating my honorarium today to the Shore Center in Kitchener, an awesome organization committed to offering anti-racist, culturally sensitive healthcare, education, contraception, pregnancy, and abortion services. They're the, main the maintainers of the Choice Connect app, which is a privacy-focused app that connects pregnant people to abortion providers across the country without collecting any more data than necessary to operate. And they also produce this awesome shirt I'm wearing today. So, shout out to Shore. So, Oh, shout out to Shore, yeah. So I'm going to begin with a story from the fall of 2014, my first semester of library school, from the one class I was taking as a part-time evening student, Introduction to LIS. We were asked to interview someone about their use of libraries, and I interviewed my mother, who spoke about requiring some staff assistance from uh, for, to access materials during a major library renovation. And the professor asked if any of our interview subjects spoke about space. Still an enthusiastic student back then, I raised my hand and I said, yes. We spoke about the challenges of being an adult with a physical disability, trying to access children's materials on small shelves during a branch renovation and, oh no, no, that's not what space means. She interrupted, like community space, like social space. And I had just submitted, I just finished my second geography degree that week. They're like, what was that for? And I sat in the back and I streamed the baseball playoffs every Wednesday night until the semester was over. Well, the World Series came first. Um, but nearly a decade later, I'm going to tell you a meandering story about what being an erstwhile geographer has taught me about libraries and in the spirit of my inability to take myself too seriously and my penchant for quoting the movie Airplane at inappropriate times, I welcome you to my talk entitled, A Library, What Is It? It's a big building where you access information, but that's not important right now. So fast forward four years, I'm in the last semester of library school and I've fallen in love. Earlier that year, a famously antisocial senior staff member at work who preferred to speak to as few colleagues as possible has asked me to learn the name of one of the new hires on the library loading dock because he didn't introduce himself and then it felt awkward. So 
he's effing awesome and he's from Saskatoon. And he's super cute and he's right there. Um, <laughs> I quickly learned he's the person you want handling your customs paperwork, intuitively understands linked data through the Marvel Universe, and that keeping a log for couriers to sign in and out has implications for understanding the provenance of rare materials. I don't want to talk about um, the classist reactions of my colleagues who couldn't believe I was dating someone doing a job that only required a high school diploma, and instead focus on how much I learned about library space from him. Oh, his name's Dustin. <laughs> um, and uh, for one of my final library school assignments, I, we had to write an evaluation plan for an information system. So I evaluated the impact of the massive impending library construction project on the loading dock, and by extension, the, um, the, the library system's logistical functions. And by that point in my MLIS, I had little faith in potential evaluators to consider the mailroom and loading dock an information system. Um, so I began the paper with a, a quote from Newman from Seinfeld, when you control the mail, you control information. And for those of you who think you've heard this from me before, uh, we collaborated on a panel with Jillian Byrne, Max Bowman, and Mike Campbell at Access 2020. So you can go back and watch that if you want. But in the end, the library renovation yielded a new entrance to the loading dock with a ceiling too low to accommodate some trucks, just like the staff could have told you. And it was then that I started to realize that libraries need to up their game when it comes to understanding physical space. Archivists are a little bit better at this, but throughout library, sorry, I mean, information school, I was taught by instructors whose pedigrees and disconnection from the work of cultural heritage institutions led to the over-theorizing of the work itself. We were taught to grapple with the intellectual problems, but not to do the work of solving them ourselves. This manifested in entire floors of backlogged work across a building with a large footprint on some of the most expensive real estate in the country. We like to talk about why people come to the library. We learned about third places, speaking the language of Starbucks, and how to welcome users to sit and stay by placemaking, but not of maintaining it, not of managing the space and stacks, or keeping our facilities clean and safe. I spent so long arguing that librarians and library schools need to take space seriously. But now I realize that perhaps this place versus space distinction isn't where my brain should have settled. So in this talk, I attempt to bring a bunch of different geographical dimensions to the library, thinking beyond place and space, and admittedly making things kind of messy and heavy. And I also ask my fellow credentialed librarians, particularly those within the, the academy, to acknowledge how destructive this cleavage between theory and practice can be when it comes to our sustainability and survival. As I mentioned, I've got two degrees in human geography, but it's a word I've barely uttered in the last few years. By the middle of the first year of my master's, I experienced crippling anxiety to the point where I couldn't complete individual sentences, which makes leading class discussions and writing a thesis nearly impossible. In the entirety of the second and most of the third year of my degree, which was funded for 12 months, I wrote nothing and then pulled it all out in the six weeks before they were going to deregister me for taking too long. But I couldn't drop out of the program because then I'd lose my student library job. And what helped me in that moment was a staff member leaving for a librarian job at just the right time with a steady paycheck that came with a tuition waiver and health benefits. When my then manager told me about the crappy salary of $52,000, I exclaimed, that's like a million dollars, having never broken 25K in my 15 years as a working person. Now that my brain isn't overtaxed by the anxiety of existing, I'm now applying what that MA program tried to teach me back then to the world that I move through now. 
And it turns out I'm not a dumbass. I just needed an e-reader and large print to be any kind of scholar. And I figured that out after I graduated. So my master's core course taught by Deb Cowan and Mark Hunter at the University of Toronto worked from a syllabus encompassing approximately 20 geographical concepts and theoretical frameworks. And we paired up and we picked nine of these to focus on teaching to each other. So what was a theoretical framework? Hell, I couldn't tell you at the time. My brain short circuited whenever the word theory was invoked. Ways of seeing the world, let's go with that. Ways of seeing libraries and other cultural heritage institutions within the world. Space. Space is geography that is measured and managed for the purposes of exploration, organization, efficiency, and optimization. By applying standardized typologies and measurements to the surface of the earth, to interiors, to exteriors, to the skies above us and to the core of the earth, it can become a target for negotiation. This is mine, that is yours. That is there, but not here. And enclosed to become property for the exclusive use of some, but not others. So activities within these spaces can be governed and curtailed. Management also involves a process of conceptual abstraction up the hierarchy of an organization, leading to those at higher ranks not understanding the nuances of the work done at lower levels. For the incredible variety of library uses, collections, services, and communities we support in our increasingly complicated workplaces, it's no wonder we need to turn to space as a metaphor for understanding what's going in, what goes on in libraries, but it can only provide us with a limited knowledge of what takes place therein. Space is the empty diamond printed on the baseball scorecard for you to fill in with pencil with each at bat. Maps. For the first and only time in my life, a family connection helped me get a job. My aunt, a nurse in Vancouver, had dinner with a librarian in town for a conference that month, and he happened to have a research grant reconstructing old Toronto from maps. She emailed me, told me to go straight up to the fifth floor of the library, ask for him and introduce myself, then go straight home and apply for the job. And the posting closed that evening. The experience that best prepared me for this job was spending my childhood sitting on my grandparents' couch with a Toronto phone book, street atlas, and postal code directory. I'd learned the software on the job. It turns out I'm pretty bad at cartography, but pretty good at spatial analysis and data management. And that's how I got my start in libraries. But to transform the three-dimensional globe into a two-dimensional printed image, we need to get rid of all of the details. Cartography relies on processes of generalization, erasing the nuance of place to collapse into space. How does the cartographer best translate the lay of the land to a map reader? And how can maps be overlaid and read together to illuminate intersections of interest using the all-seeing bird's eye view? And how does one attempt to reconcile the various research methods of scholars who believe that the land is theirs to know everything about? Architecture schools are particularly bad at sending all of their students to the library separately, saying they'll give you all these data sets for locations far away from us without acknowledging the fact that we didn't have them in the first place, nor the ethics or costs of collecting such data. We were just letting them down because we didn't have it. Governmental jurisdictions don't mesh with watersheds, the catchment area of health centers, the noise buffer around a logistics facility, and especially not the traditional territories of indigenous peoples. But these official frameworks are how map and geospatial data collections are organized. Collecting, combining, and managing cartographic sources is inherently messy as seen here in a map that Sarah Simkin and I created during our undergraduate days, assisting the World Wildlife Fund with the evaluation of a GIS-based landscape conservation tool. So in this map, we see the boundaries of Parks Canada's James Bay Coastal Natural Region 
overlaying the eco-regions and eco-zones of the National Ecological Framework for Canada. As always, merely viewing maps can tell us different things about the land or distract us from what nature is trying to tell us. Nature, untouched, wild, awesome, undeveloped, empty, uninhabited, exotic. In fact, nature exists only in relation to capitalism after it has been measured, explored, exploited, and violently colonized. Common understandings of nature position it in contrast to industry and modernity, with populations who have lived on these lands for millennia positioned as in opposition to civilization. The proximity to nature is used to market single-family suburban homes built in car-dependent communities on underprotected greenbelt lands. Since March 2020, I've been in a group chat with 85% Californians, including Elizabeth Nicola, an artist in San Francisco who documents her relationships with the animals who visit her backyard, including a scrub jay named Frank, shown here. As someone who has lived their entire life within 10 kilometers of their present location, oh wait, no, when I was writing that, it was my present location. <laughs> I've been lucky to experience respiratory challenges due to wildfires only once in my life. But my friends in California have had N95s on hand for years. My last time in an airplane, I was on the way home from a conference in Vancouver listening to an ambient dirge about uh, running a wildfire while that went on in reality below me. I've tried not to make my lengthy commute anyone's business, eating the costs of a car, fuel, and time spent in traffic, but I can't justify the trip to work. I increasingly cannot just justify the trip to work, let alone tack on an overseas vacation onto the other end of a conference and have work partially pick up the bill. Nature is also the name of a suite of highly prestigious academic journals, some of which charge 14,000 Canadian to the authors of accepted articles. Scale. With exploration, mapping, and colonization, and the incredible violence and cultural genocide that accompanies it, the world opens up to those who seek to explore it, causing different relationships, patterns, and power dynamics to emerge. Globalization often forces us to think simultaneously at the scale of the home, the city, the region, focusing on both the local and the global, affecting our understandings of community, industry, economy, and governance. And for those of us in the global north, we're often unaware or willfully ignorant of the forces that um, continue to foster uneven development. Of course, Diasporic communities understand this multi-scalar existence intimately. One cannot just turn off events happening elsewhere in one's world. I note that on the campus where I work, this month's protests and vigils for the women murdered by the Iranian state took place in front of the library that I work at. And the biggest protest gathering I saw in the province, in the Toronto suburb of Richmond Hill, flooded the grounds near the Central Library as well. Libraries are good at operating across scales and around arbitrary limits through consortia, interlibrary loan networks, and by an underappreciated open repository infrastructure to which my personal well-being is presently tethered. In the earliest weeks of the pandemic, Campus IT set up an Alibaba-based VPN to assist students who were preventing from accessing class resources by the firewalls of their home countries. At a smaller scale, if it's just random books you're looking for, you might be lucky to find a cast off Microsoft Access for Dummies or chicken soup for the vegan soul in your local neighborhood book exchange. Of course, the Little Free Libraries organization is proud to exist at a global scale, but can unorganized independent book boxes actually fill literacy gaps that have much more to do with austerity and poverty? Forgive me if that's the one question that I have no desire to answer anymore, as I asked it once before. We went viral, fielding interview requests, hate mail, and professional support from all over the world for daring to question something so earnest and cute. 
Going viral is wild. And the disorientation that comes with the collapse of scale and context is something. And I'm grateful that I presented as a woman at that time. The strangest part is that I was still in library school and a professor known for her research on public libraries rejigged her syllabus that summer to include our just published paper, which prompted fierce debates in her class that my friend was enrolled in. He texts me, he just raised his hand to let her know that one of the authors is a student in the program right now. And I email her to thank her for reading it and raising it with the class, offering to come and talk about it, or even just to learn about what was discussed. No reply. I never understood why there was such reticence to engage with the work of those outside the faculty bargaining unit. The body. This is the topic I gravitated to presenting on for reasons that I thought might clear some of the thoughts in my head. That week, I donned a chest binder in public for the first time to speak about Judith Butler and the energy required to sustain dynamic gender performances across different audiences. From the mass media, to advertising, to clinical trial participation, to accessing materials in libraries and official archives, the question of who sees themselves and their bodies represented are highly political. From the hidden corners of my elementary school library, where we wed, where did I come from and what's happening to me? I've attempted to cultivate safe private spaces for me to learn about my own body, whether they be at the end of a library range next to a wall or with a VPN and a private browser window. What can we do as libraries to facilitate safety in one's own body? when simply searching for abortion and gender-affirming care might be a crime in your jurisdiction. One day, sometime before the 2019 election, I listened to an episode of the Sandy and Nora podcast, in which the hosts discussed objections to keeping politics out of the office. As someone who serves on the executive of their Librarians and Archivists Association, I've been on all sides of, should we be writing another open letter that does not explicitly have to do with our jobs as librarians. But how can I not think of my workplace, the library, as political, when this is where I was first able to recognize how much my life in this form, in this body, had value and meaning. For many of my colleagues, a number of whom had not known a trans person before, to have them actively participate in making not just my life, but the lives of fellow trans folks at Waterloo more livable. And then for them to take that activism beyond the workplace, for me to exist and do my job as an ordinary worker is political. Here today to put my body on display for you is a vulnerable, radical political act. Sometime after I finished school, I began a gender transition and though I expected changes to happen to my physical form, what I didn't expect was all of the anxiety short-circuiting my brain to melt away. Sentences finished, the depressed and selfish nervous jerk leaving me. And for the first time in my life, I had courage. Imagine wearing someone else's glasses for your entire life, and after decades of living, you're finally able to articulate, describe, and care for who and what's around you. So many of the people I work with didn't know me before as someone who barely wanted to be here. I've developed the greatest friendships with coworkers or who are my greatest allies. What if you could just snap your fingers and have someone help someone be their very best self? Trans healthcare is mental health care. In the before time, I volunteered on panels of real life queer and trans folks on campus to explain to staff just how easy it is to be welcoming of us. Believe us when we tell, me, when we tell you who we are, that's it. Wouldn't you rather hear me talk about Star Trek in the new baked potato restaurant at the plaza? I asked the audience. Helping our, us live our lives enables us to do just that. In the first winter of the pandemic, 
I played the 2018 video game Celeste, which I'm showing here, a puzzle platform in which you play Madeline, a solo backpacker, dealing with panic and anxiety while climbing the eponymous Mount Celeste, where your aim is to survive each jump while collecting as many strawberries as possible. Madeline never dies as a result of a bad jump. She just rematerializes at the beginning of the screen with a symbol crash. You jump, you fall, you jump, you jump, you fling yourself into the abyss. And as your comfort with the mechanics of gravity and time space increases, the feeling of launching yourself into the void over and over gets a little less daunting. As you become more acclimatized to your body's strange movements, I'm going to play that again. <laughs> I, um, you admit that some of your footfalls might not be secure and potentially catastrophic, but YOLO. You practice each jump in sequence until it feels properly choreographed and rehearsed. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's the video game I felt most viscerally in my flesh, despite having many of the same dynamics as Super Mario Brothers, which I've been playing all my life. You just need to put your head down and survive. And if you don't get all the strawberries, that's okay. You do your best. But this video here, Madeline encounters an environment where as soon as she jumps away from the surface with these little red hairs on it, it turns into a place that can hurt her if she lands on it again. And yet sometimes she only knows how to survive by returning to these places that hurt again and again. If that isn't the perfect metaphor for queer and trans life, I don't know what is. Leaving the house for any reason these days is now something I pre-rehearse to the point of exhaustion, preparing for all of the ways, uh, preparing for all of the ways something I've done so many times before can now hurt me in different ways. I am here to do with you today as a demonstration and manifestation of courage, having flung myself off a platform, knowing nothing can save me if I miss the strawberry. Once more onto the breach. Mobilities. More, just, more than just movement from one place to another, Mobilities refers to the myriad ways, means, and reasons of getting from point A to B to C to Z and all other combinations therein. Who goes to work? Who can get to work in the first place? Who gets to travel for business, for leisure, or to be away from their families for several years at a time? For those of us staying put, how do the necessities of life get to us? Mobilities enable the global networks and luxuries we're used to and transport and commercial deregulation penalize those living in rural and remote locations. The same provincial government that funds less and less of our university each year plows ahead with Highway 413. To connect to the highway, I spend much of my working life on. I live over, just over 100 kilometers from my office. In my four years on the job, I've seen the entire length of Highway 401 from the 427 in Toronto to Highway 8 in Kitchener, under construction, widened and widened again. I drive back and forth to work because the only public transit option would have me on the bus for the same amount of time that I would be in the office each day and costs more per day than a month of parking. I carpool with contingent faculty from the nearby university in exchange for oboe lessons. In my first year on the job, I did this four or five times per week and returned once a week during pandemic, between pandemic waves to speak to colleagues across the room on Microsoft Teams. The planned direct transit connection between Waterloo and Guelph was canceled, so that highway that connects them can be widened instead. I haven't driven to work in a while. I move my car around the block in accordance with my parking permit instead of driving 200 kilometers per day. I rarely venture more than a kilometer from my apartment, a combination of public health habit and ultimately agoraphobia. I have not worked from a remote location, connecting from a new climate or time zone. There are lots of places I'd like to visit someday, but, understanding, but understand that environmentally and epidemiologically, my personal decisions are as important as collective actions. I'm constantly asked, why don't you move closer to work? I can't afford to give up rent control to move for increased housing costs and ask my partner to give up his career, which is by this point really cool, <laughs> more interesting than mine. 
These days, Waterloo students pay more for individual rooms in shared accommodation than we do for our two-bedroom Toronto apartment. In retrospect, I wish I stuck to my initial idea for a geography thesis, examining Canadian nationalism through end-of-broadcast day B-roll montages over the national anthem at the start and end of TV programming. Instead, I went with the only good idea I had. It turns out one can't ask the question, what's the deal with this place, like Jerry Seinfeld, when you're in grad school. I can't tell you how many tears I shed while refusing to look my supervisor in the eye while coming up with a question acceptable to the academy. What's the deal with the highway of heroes, I asked, and I ultimately ended up rephrasing it in terms of landscape. So for those of you unfamiliar, the highway of heroes was a stretch of Highway 401 connecting Canadian Forces Base Trenton with the Office of the Chief Coroner of Ontario in Toronto, along which the remains of Canadian soldiers killed in military operations overseas were transported in a repatriation motorcade, with locals waving Canadian flags on highway overpasses above. Back then, the coroner's office was just off Yonge Street in downtown Toronto, on a side street behind police headquarters, and flag-bearing civilians welcome and saluting uniforms welcomed their bodies home. I asked, for those witnessing the ceremony, from their cars in 401 traffic to photographs on the front page of the newspaper, what is the political effect of this temporary solemn interruption of the flows of ordinary life seen from these many viewpoints? Exactly like the genre of landscape painting, Landscape theory asks us to consider the relationship between the viewer and the constructed images in their field of view and how they came to be. The rolling hills of Northumberland County alongside semi-trucking highways getting the goods to the people of Ontario who stand saluting the cortege represents a dogged Canadianness, but not as much in Mohawk territory to the east as pictured here where they subvert the popular understanding of the warrior along the same corridor. In contrast, the downtown coroner's office was surrounded by thousands who didn't know what was taking place. The repetition of symbols and signs throughout our visual cultures suggests to us that North American downtown landscape are full of tall buildings, grime, pollution, crime, drugs, and sex. A few blocks south of the former coroner's office, the Toronto Metropolitan University Library lies behind Zanzibar, one of the last strip clubs left on Yonge Street. Post-colonialism. On our syllabus, we read Frantz Fanon, Fanon, Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak, and concentrated on decolonization and independence movements in the Middle East and Africa. At the time, I was woefully understudied and ignorant when it came to ongoing colonialism in our midst. And yet, I am told my proposed thesis work doesn't go far enough. I have to push farther, make it more political by introducing a second case study because it doesn't stand alone. I fill out an ethics protocol for graduate research, marking my risk of methodological harm and risk to research subjects as medium and high on the low, medium, high matrix. My supervisor amends it to say, low risk, low risk. If you say so, she knows better. It gets approved with no revisions requested, which I'm told is uncommon. So I take the GO train to the eastern suburbs to interview the Canadian Forces Chief Repatriation Officer during the Kandahar mission at a Tim Hortons, where we share pictures of our cats as he has a big curly mustache like my cat Pico. And then I borrow $3,000 from my grandmother to pay for the remainder of my research costs. Two sets of flights to Northern British Columbia to spend four days driving the Highway of Tears, asking the impossible question, who gets to occupy a highway to acknowledge lives lost to violence? I have been connected for an interview with a residential school survivor who has lost four members of her family. I tearfully admit to the professor I'm staying with that before we set out, I'm not qualified for any of this. How the hell did this get approved? What am I doing? I learned ghosts are real. I didn't listen to the interview recording. 
I don't li write about any of it. I didn't know how to fight back. I didn't know how to say no. I had no idea how to ever be the student my supervisor wanted and I should have said no to her. And uh, now I reckon with my participation in intellectual colonialism out loud for the first time. I think of what repatriation means. Is it the reverent return of remains from an imperial occupying force? Or is it the return of cultural heritage and knowledge, the communities from whence they came, and the work that we can do beyond this return? The post in post-colonialism does not mean it's over. How about, not, how about we not rush to recolonize re by rushing to register for indigenous knowledge workshops while saying we're decolonizing? How about we say no to supporting unethical research projects? Why not respect the expertise of those in our midst? Why is participation in research and having our names on important published works the most important part of our jobs? How about we don't expect to have our jobs and our power forever? In concert with indigenizing predominantly white spaces, can we ensure the sustainable, sustainability of indigenous knowledges via land back movements and environmental stewardship as well? Racial capitalism. This wasn't one of the topics discussed in our class, but I add it here because it's helped me make sense of all of the previous themes. Racial capitalism is the framework that, prevents, is, that presents these spatial logics as the natural order of things by exploiting minoritized populations in subjugated positions to maintain the status quo. From saving time and money through the convenience and service industry to intellectual property laws inhibiting the take up of COVID-19 and other vac vaccinations to the ongoing exploitation, surveillance and securitization of foreign nationals and domestic threats alike. To all of the scholars prevented from presenting their work at conferences due to visa requirements and travel costs. There are many intersections with the work we do as librarians. I was writing this while watching the worst of all of the long running police procedurals, Criminal Minds, which combines the longest of logical leaps with a real time surveillance network based on thousands of data sources. Though Penelope Garcia's spatial analysis was too sophisticated for its time, this algorithmic surveillance apparatus uh, is now absolutely a thing of the present and academic research publishers are at its forefront. Sarah Lambden's forthcoming book, Data Cartels, which drops next month, traces companies like Reed Elsevier, LexisNexis, and Thomson Reuters on their corporate transformation through purchasing, collecting, and creating new data points to sell to police departments, militaries, and border security agencies throughout the world. This is what a good chunk of our library budgets are invested in. I told you at the outset that this presentation might be a little overwhelming and all over the place. And I maintain that I'm not trying to argue that no one is talking about this, but I'd like to read the Goodreads synopsis of this book with the same title by Patricia Lockwood. As this urgent genre defying book opens, a, a woman who has recently been elevated to prominence for her social media posts travels around the world to meet her adoring fans. She is overwhelmed by navigating the new language and etiquette of what she terms the portal, where she grapples with an unshakable conviction that a vast chorus of voices are now dictating her thoughts. When existential threats from climate change and economic precariousness to the rise of an unnamed dictator and an epidemic of loneliness begins to, begins to loom, she posts her way deeper into the portal's void. An avalanche of images, details, and references accumulate to form a landscape that is post-sense, post-irony, post-everything. Are we in hell? The people of the portal ask themselves. Are we just going to keep doing this until we die? It's that last second, sentence that I'd like us to dwell on. Am I going to commute like this until I die? Are we going to pay to publish until we die? Will the land we work on continue to exist? Now, back to libraries. You haven't heard me talk about my job too much. I realize in addressing an audience of library technologists, you're very likely used to being hushed when you bring up inconvenient issues, like maintenance. 
And the community of individuals I'm addressing these thoughts to might not overlap, but this is the only chance I'll have to put these thoughts together and get them out there. So. I'm no longer employable in this field, is something I heard several times from non-white librarians of varying gender identities working in predominantly white institutions. I know this was before I became a librarian and before I myself transitioned. I've heard this phrase uttered as some of the smartest people I know keep their heads down, hoping to survive the rest of their lives in quiet despair, or as bridges are left to burn by those not willing to hear them speak inconvenient truths. I didn't understand what that meant to me until about six weeks ago, preparing for what I was going to say during this talk until I found myself in the same position. Nina and Lisa, I think of you often. You give me this courage. Much to the chagrin of many of my academic library colleagues across Canada, I don't think we should automatically be considered faculty because we have a terminal degree in our field. I'm well acquainted with other academic librarians looking askance at my employer as University of Waterloo librarians are not faculty, not unionized, and somehow that makes us the worst case scenario, the most precarious. For what it's worth, my worst case scenario employer pays me $95,000 four years out of school, my salary having gone up nearly $30,000 since I joined the organization. You can read the frequently asked questions on our Librarians and Archivists Association website if you'd like to know more about why we recently voted to stay staff. But for me, that decision was made in solidarity with other library staff colleagues and a refusal to introduce additional power stratifications into the workplace. Our actions have been called anti-union and anti-collective, even though the question of unionization wasn't even on the table. I've been accused of being a class traitor, but I'm here to say that you cannot decolonize the library while simultaneously arguing that you deserve to have your power over others entrenched by default to make more money and tell people what to do so you can buy a house. At the 2021 New Librarian Symposium, Yoon-hee Lee gave an incredible presentation entitled, What if we were to think of ourselves as workers under racial capitalism? From the moment we enter library school, what if we were taught to understand ourselves as agents of violent and oppressive systems based on precarity and profit? Uni is also the co-author of an important open letter to the profession on the removal of the MLIS credential from librarian roles. A removal that I personally support given that this credential, particularly at our alma mater, can be obtained without taking a single course in LIS and is increasingly tied to be able to afford $20,000 or the equivalent on credit. She and her co-authors make the case that the loosening of credentials will disproportionately benefit white job candidates. And she and her co-authors are absolutely correct. Two things can be true at the same time. I'm feeling like the pursuit of prestige has stripped the health of our library community from the minds of many librarians while observing that the workplace advocacy of academic librarians has served to alienate others in the same building. The same goes for tenured faculty and their attitudes towards contingent lecturers and public school workers alike. I ask librarians, why are you here? Is it the job? Is it the profile, the prestige, the vocational awe? And if you haven't yet read Fobazi Guitar, get on that. If we discuss this openly. Could we distribute our loads? Could we learn how to say no instead of, oh, it's only natural, it's the library. I'm at a crossroads in my life where the conscious actions of others in my profession, the technologies that we employ, but also the core values of intellectual and academic freedom, which protect the rights of white supremacists and trans-exclusionary radical feminists to speak against our survival. These conditions preclude me from continuing to exist in your world. I'm not saying these conditions, I'm not saying these concepts should be ab abolished, but approached with far more nuance. Likewise, our unions and professional associations are critical to ensuring the ongoing existence of our species, 
But how about those members hurt by their actions? How can I do my job when the last librarian to introduce me at a conference defended his right to creep shot sex workers on their break from his office window? How can I do my job when I'm asked to better algorithmically estimate someone's gender and race based on their name? When I spent a year of my life working with a cross-campus coalition to develop an equity, an ethical equity data survey. When the real life struggles of a department of real human beings just become fodder for librarians to write fiction with some names conveniently changed, but the person who survived a health crisis in real life dies in the book. When the library resources we build and maintain are seeking as lacking compared to our ed tech colleagues, whose business models are built on collecting as much private student data as possible instead of none. How can I do my job when your labor advocacy means you can work from wherever you want, but you won't go as far as ensuring your colleagues have a safe workplace at peak pandemic? And are any of these conditions going to change? If your instincts upon hearing this are to be offended and defensive, I'm not coming for you and your job. I'm just telling you that this profession is not one I can continue to be a part of for much longer because I can't turn my brain off and neatly partition these breaches of trust as if they don't impact my working conditions. I cannot continue to exist in universities with a mission to specialize in everything and, and everything and anything and therefore offer services beyond our means. To burn out on service work, translating demands into actions on behalf of an institution that will always be seen as dropping the ball. The hard work of translating equity and inclusion rhetoric into meaningful action is rarely welcomed with sincerity, with, but claims that it's not enough. And those saying so are correct, it's not enough. But to be told this, from above by those not putting the work in has gotten to me. I've been let down by those who seek to benefit from collective action instead, uh, or without putting in the work and extending the benefits to others instead of pulling the ladder up behind them. Equity, diversity, and inclusion programs with dedicated staff will not change power structures until you reckon with the pain and breaches of trust experienced by existing staff. And for me, that includes normalizing the practice of authors spending thousands of dollars to publish articles they wrote. One article processing charge is first and last month's rent on an apartment. Two article processing charges would pay for gender affirming surgery, not covered by insurance. But I need to be very clear here. I couldn't work with a greater team than the digital initiatives crew at Waterloo. Shout out to Krista Godfrey and Allison Hitchens for their compassionate, flexible, and realistic leadership. I'll never forget going into my first performance appraisal with Krista approximately a year into the pharmaceutical prescription that changed my life. She remarked, you've had a tough year, to which I immediately protested as I was the happiest I'd ever been. And at that moment, I understood how much I needed someone to acknowledge what I had been through in the office. But what is it that libraries and archives need during this time more than anything? Now that inclusion experts offer workshops on trauma-informed library work that you can take in two hours and consider yourself educated, I'm going to take a different approach to explaining the dynamics I find lacking. And if you so wish, you can throw yourself into seven seasons. Oh, that's Jordan Peterson. <laughs> You can throw yourself into seven seasons of Star Trek Deep Space, Deep Space Nine. I had the privilege of assisting my dear friend David K. Seitz, a brilliant cultural geographer now working at Harvey Mudd College, in preparing images for his uh, forthcoming book, A Different Track, Radical Geographies of Deep Space Nine, and I was able to read a first draft of his manuscript. It is through cultural st studies traditions like the one that he writes in that give me an, ent an, an entry point to super heady theory by explaining them through creative examples that I'm familiar with. 
So he asks, what if we interpret Deep Space Nine through the lens of racial capitalism and Afrofuturist philosophy, examining violence, labor, survival, and freedom as forces that cement and destroy the hierarchies that masquerade as the natural order of things, and examine the role of trauma and grief as one of the art organizational logics of life. For those of you who aren't familiar with the plot, Starfleet has moved into the emptying Cardassian space station, now, overseeing, now tasked with overseeing the decolonization of the planet Bajor in partnership with the Bajoran militia, consisting of survivors of settler colonial violence, many of whom worked in forced labor camps and experienced militarized sexual abuse at the hands of the Cardassians. In charge is Commander ben Benjamin Sisko, a recently widowed father of one whose battle died, whose, sorry, whose wife died at the Battle of Wolf 359, um, shown in this meme here. He was killed when, she was killed when Jean-Luc Picard was temporarily assimilated into the Borg Collective and attacked our solar system. And this meme here really, get, by the Soy Track podcast, um, really gets across the, um, the imperial, um, but, but, but Ben the, the, the benign imperial saviors of, of, of Starfleet are really the ones who actually continue a lot of the violence, or, or uh, maintain a lot of the violence in this world. So Cisco is an African-American man from New Orleans. He, uh, he continues to experience anti-black racism in the enlightened Star Trek future. DS9 lies at the entrance of a stable wormhole created and maintained by wormhole aliens connecting the Alpha and Gamma Quadrants. But if you ask the indigenous Bajorans, it is the celestial temple and the prophets ensure a safe voyage for all who pass through. And the prophets have named Sisko their emissary. He's trying to raise a, t uh, raise a teenager on a posting he doesn't exactly want, has to deal with the man who killed his wife, is suddenly a major religious figure and having to manage these pressures with new everyday relationships with someone who's lost their home and has fought for their survival since childhood, a keener new grad who has a lot to learn about working in community, someone who has lived seven lives already across multiple bodies and genders containing the spirit and wisdom of them all, the bartender and broker to the informal economy who cares about profit above all, his brother who hasn't heard a word of positive feedback in years, and his son, a first-generation academic. O'Brien, the guy who fixes literally everything. The PhD holder who put her career on hold for her husband's job and now teaches elementary school. The only one of his kind who is extremely lonely. A queer exile who may or may not be a spy who can never go home. And Space Karen. DS9 is kind of a mess and its inhabitants are traumatized. The missions, values, and hierarchies of the institutions overlap and collide on the station. The universe is a place where racialized violence is tied to the structures of everyday life, where substance dependency is weaponized against an entire people. It is a place where sex work exists. Shout out to Jake Sisko for bringing a Dabo girl home to meet his dad, the station commander. Despite Starfleet abolishing currency, profit still exists on the backs of workers, but workers of Quark's Bar unite and unionize. Living across multiple bodies and genders is normalized. People fall in love and form families with children or without. Over the course of the series, the viewer sees how much they can't live without each other. Their survival is built on their mutual liberation and care. But Jordan, this is goofy. We're not in the 24th century. We're not at war. But as Lydia Zvagenseva reminded us in a very thoughtful and practical pre presentation on library pedagogy recently, for many of us, there is a war going on outside. While we wait for the next attack or the next disaster, we can still take care of one another. While you're waiting for trust to be institutionalized, enact it. This isn't such a bummer in a as a talk because I learned that I do hold hope. There is power in a union and between meetings and collective agreement negotiations, there is incredible power in individual acts. 
The most welcomed I felt in my relatively short time at Waterloo is when individuals with power listened and asked how they could change the system when something they hadn't considered was brought to their attention. When I became a supervisor of a series of, black and, of awesome young black and brown women on their co-op terms, I learned so much about how easy it was for me to say, I am going to take the burden of work off of you today so you can take care of yourself. My friend Cecily Walker taught me so much about what she could have used as a black librarian attempting to live and work through unending reminders of racial injustice. And I proactively offered that flexibility and empathy to my students and to others in the workplace. What can I do to help lessen your load? For so many of us listening to this right now, you have no idea how much power you have. Take on the burden of speaking up for those around you and checking in on them. Cecily describes this here in a 2020 keynote speech. I have a MP3 of her actually speaking this. Thank you. If I could urge you to do anything as a result of this keynote, it would be to break the silence. Talk openly and often about the kinds of interpersonal struggles you're experiencing, especially if those struggles are a result of quote unquote cultural fit or your perceived otherness. Speak up when you witness bias against your minoritized colleagues and listen to us. Listen to us as we share these stories without explaining or justifying the treatment we've experienced. Make noise. Be heard. Oh, I guess. <laughs> That's just one paragraph. That's okay. <laughs> your safety, your mental health, your confidence and your abilities are worth the effort and worth the risk. Not only will you lift your own burden by daring to speak out and speak truth to power, but the conversation you begin will also benefit others who have, I assure you, felt exactly the same or very similar to how you're feeling right now. To quote Massive Attack's Protection, the song I listened to on repeat all through high school, I'll stand in front of you, I'll take the force of the blow. We are good at expressing support for other constituencies, but so rarely for those closest to us. While you're waiting, waiting for that trust to be institutionalized, enact it yourself. Let's hear from Cecily again. I believe the future of this profession isn't just dependent on publishers negotiating their ebook licensing deals or staying ahead of the rapidly changing technological requirements that our patrons expect of us. Our future is also dependent on how libraries include its most vulnerable workers and how we prepare them for success. When I think of what the library of the future might look like, I not only imagine a space where patrons have open and unfettered access to the resources they need to enrich their lives, but I also dream of a world where minoritized library workers are fully supported, are well represented in library leadership roles, and never have to bear the burden of cultural isolation or questions about their cultural fit. A dream of a profession where the troublemakers continue to make good trouble and where this good trouble causes those in the majority to acknowledge these injustices and become advocates for dismantling these systems and creating something new that benefits all of us. This good trouble will mean inconvenience, difficulty, and yes, chaos. But in the long run, it reminds us that while we may be different, our different makes it so that we can't continue to coast on a sense of fairness that only benefits the majority. We are united within this system, and it's everyone's responsibility to make it a place where we can all be successful, regardless of how that success is defined. The last time I traveled was in October 2019 to Vancouver, a city I have very mixed feelings about. Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, AKA the greatest band in the world, Shut Up and Take My Money, had just released a new album. And I listened to it exclusively for a week with the 14 minute long closer Hollywood, a song about surviving climate disaster with your loved ones on repeat the most. 
Towards the end, he sings in a grieving falsetto. Darling, your dreams are your greatest part. I carry them with you in my heart. Or I carry them with me in my heart, yeah. The studio the song was recorded in burned down just after the album was released. I got some bad news recently, having initially survived a series of ultimately disabling incidents, and I'm continuing to work through them. So I've been off work for six weeks as a result. But I felt it was come important to come here and talk to you today, to express to you. I'm not sure how long I can do this. Between the application upgrades I'm years behind on, the impossibility of success in a privately run knowledge creation ecosystem stacked against authors and non-commercial entities, and the messy geographies of libraries that I've explained to you today. Over the last few years, I've lost the ability to dream because nothing ever ends. I would like to have a dream, not a goal, and work towards it in the hopes of attaining it while I still have time. I don't think I can do that in a system based on continuously promising the impossible and saying yes, 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 without taking care of itself. I'm going to miss a lot about libraries, but I need to substantially narrow the scope of my life. And I think I might want to take a dance class. As I mentioned, I'm off work for a bit, but you can still contact me at jhale at uwaterloo.ca. I just might not get to it for a while. Thank you all so much for listening. Thanks so much, Jordan. That was great. Um, messy geographies, messy places. Putting the geography in our work places, I think was really interesting and such a, a marvelous way to start us off and get our brains buzzing a little bit first thing this morning. And thank you for being so vulnerable up here. It's a tricky thing to do and definitely takes courage, um, which you talked about. So thank you so much. We will see if there are any questions from our uh, in-person or Slido or uh, Zoom attendees on Slido. Um, if I don't know if there are any <laughs> questions coming through, so I will um, cool pause that. a little bit. We'll just see. No, we'll give people time to kind of sift and think if they have anything that they want to ask Jordan. I will field those questions and, and uh, pass them along if they come through. Also, this is our first foray into Slido of the conference, and so we're just seeing how that works. It may be technical issues. I don't know. I'm just going to keep talking <laughs> for a little bit longer until I see a screen that looks like it might have questions or not have questions on it. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, <laughs> she is off the hook, or they are off the hook in more ways than one. <laughs> um, okay. So I saw that Zoom says chat disabled. So questions shouldn't come through Zoom. Questions sh should come through uh, Slido. So if you do have questions for Jordan, please um, uh, stick them in Slido. Um, but it doesn't look, it looks like we're... Uh, it looks like that you, as I said, you may be off the hook. We'll give people a moment. Yeah? Sorry, I'm having issues with Slido because it has like a long question and there's a pretty short word limit. I'm trying oh, to no. be uh, very pithy, but it's tricky. Is it okay to ask verbally or are we excluding our virtual folks that way? Okay, so we, we have a, a question in the room, someone who wants to ask a long question and Slido is not letting them answer a long or ask a long question. So what we will do is you ask your question, I will repeat it in as well as I can for so that our uh, remote people can hear it and then uh, we'll get Jordan to uh, to answer it. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, okay, sorry, it's not that long. No, no, no. It's not one of those like, no. statement questions. We're all good. Um, okay, so our <laughs> day access like the walk-in access for the public um you know first i guess due to covid and now for sure. i don't know whatever reason and when we recently brought this up one of the things that was mentioned was that um you know we've noticed during uh keeping it close to the public that like there's pretty much no theft anymore so you know apparently there was like a 
small, you know, area or you know, small group of pros maybe coming in, picking up laptops and this kind of thing. Can I can I stop you there so I can do the first part of the question before it leaves my brain? <laughs> okay. So the the person who's asking the question has said that during COVID their library was uh, shut down to. Um, some uh, in-person traffic, like, uh, and that it was noticed that thefts went down while that happened. First part of the question done. Second part of the question. <laughs> so I guess my question is about like the balance between, you know, good for the what we think of as like the core center group, central group we're supposed to have our eye on all the time, our students versus the broader mandate that we should have and just the, I guess the tension between, like in the space between those things when we're enforcing the security of this kind of thing at the door. That's, that's my Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best to repeat. I may get it wrong, but luckily Jordan's in the room and heard the actual question. <laughs> so the question is about balancing the use of the library space um, among our core users, and in this case, it is an academic library, so students, um, and then the wider public, which we also have a mandate to serve in some way. So how do we balance those needs, and particularly around space, when, it's, when security could be an issue? Now we hear that you're talking about Robarts and Gerstein. Um, I, 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 I understand that thefts ha have gone down, but I I'm a lurker of, of the U of T subreddit, even though I still, even though I quit like five years ago, I can't stop reading. And the thefts continue, I hear. And I think that I, I don't, I, I, I think it's, 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 it's far more important to provide safe spaces that we all have a role in playing, in, 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 sorry, in, 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 in co-creating, including the people who have, um, who are leaving their laptops, their phones, et cetera, out. It sucks that we can't always trust one another, but keep your personal devices on you when you go to the bathroom. I, I don't want to blame people. I don't really know how to answer this question, but I feel like excluding people who aren't necessarily part of the university community, they might be a researcher from, from another institution. I feel like creating additional security, um, um, secu like creating additional like check-in measures to enter what sh once was a space that one could just walk into, that is also a kind of, um, that also introduces a kind of surveillance as well. If you are checking in to go into the building that you work in or study in, I don't think there's there's any wrong. Like I I I don't really know how to deal with this, but I think that um, the, the the fact that um, security reports went down and it was just such a uh, 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 it was so difficult to keep all of these um, incidents dealt with and maintained without finding the solution or the perpetrator or whatever. I don't know. It's, 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 it's really tough, but I feel like actually creating and keeping open the space for folks is the most important part. University reddits are fascinating. Can't stop. Thanks. And yeah, I think that's I think that's it for questions. Shall we have some shall we have some snacks? Shall I have a break? Okay. Um, I should have the time with me and I do not have the time. No, with nor me. do I. Because I did not bring up my phone because I was nor like, it's I. all gonna be on the on the monitor. Awesome. Sweet. Uh, we are back at eleven. Um, so there is food and coffee in the room beside us for those in person. Zoom folks, you have to make your own arrangements. Um, washrooms are still where I told you, whether you're here or online. <laughs> um, it looks like it's raining possibly, but the patio doors are open. So if, if it isn't raining and you want to get a little breath of fresh air, 
uh, you can go outside, um, or you can you can do whatever you want for the next half hour. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jordan. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thank you.
Yeah, and if you look at the map, like Google Maps, while you're, uh, you're doing it, because the scooter's kind of in both hands all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, all these map paths are just creeping, or there's like a road to construction or anything like that. It's just the street. If they remember it. <laughs>
Testing. Testing. Okay. Thanks.
Microsoft Teams, Zoom, uh, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Cameron. I work at Carleton University. I'm here to present the next session, which is going to be presented remotely to us. Uh, the session title is Bibliotech, Building a Collaboration Future-Oriented Instruction Program for Information Studies Students. Presenting this morning will be Elisa Rod, the Research Data Management Specialist at McGill University Library, Carolyn Pekoski, is the Metadata and Electronic Resources Librarian at McGill. Kristen Howard, the Liaison Librarian for History, Classical Studies, and Indigis Indigenous Studies at McGill. Clara Terp, Systems Librarian at McGill University. Robin Demieux has been a cataloging librarian at McGill University since 2015, specializing in rare and special collections and linked data. And finally, Nadine Derache, an associate professor at EBSI, Université de Montréal. She studies the information behavior of scientific and cultural actors in their creation or research and publishing process. Welcome to Bibliotech, building a collaborative future-oriented instruction program for LIS students. I'll begin by talking about the background. Bibliotech was based on North Carolina State University's Library Career Jumpstart Program, a program started and run by the Library Fellows at NCSU. As the NCSU Library received applications for its Fellows Program, it noticed that many applicants were lacking in knowledge or skills in library technology. As NCSU has no library school, it was determined they could begin a week-long skills developing summer program to help meet this need. The Jumpstart program debuted in summer 2020 as a free, immersive, virtual program with the goals of teaching and building foundational tech skills, exposing library students to library technology careers, and allowing students the opportunity to network with peers and professionals. The ultimate goal was to prepare first-year library students to begin careers in library technology upon graduation. I participated in the second iteration of the program in summer 2021 and was able to bring this perspective to planning our own version of the Jumpstart program, Bibliotech. 
for our first year of Bibliotech, we made it explicit that it was a pilot, and this enabled us to do a couple of things. One, it is a big flag that we are learning, and we wanted to make sure that we left lots of space to be iterative and adaptive and to listen as we went. Another core element of our planning process was in order to build relevant content for students, we had lots of ideas of what we thought could be good and useful to them with different technologies and panels, but we really didn't feel comfortable building something for someone without them with us. So we brought in students and their perspectives in two uh, key ways. One, we made sure that we had some students on our organizing committee. So as a pilot, Keeping the program small, we decided to focus it on the Montreal area because we had two library schools, right? We have EBSI from the Université de Montréal and we have the program at McGill. So we had one student from each program on our committee to offer feedback and their perspectives. Furthermore, uh, Nadine had Clara and I believe Carolyn go into her class that she was teaching to speak to students and to get their feedback through a survey that we designed. We wanted to know not just what they wanted to learn and what they were interested in uh, to have offered, but also their comfort levels and their perspectives on technology. And so that would help us accomplish two things. One, it will help us level the workshops to the appropriate space. We all know that Sometimes with workshops, it can be a bit of a drop the needle game on a record, right? If you put it in the middle of the song, maybe they're not gonna get it unless they know the album really well. So that was another way for us to help uh, foolproof our curriculum. We also decided early in on some core components of what Bibliotech would look like. Um, and that would be like NCSU's Jumpstart, a virtual format. We wanted a mix of hands-on workshops and panels just to kind of give people's brains a little bit of change and also to offer different perspectives so they can learn skills. But there was also an identified need to hear about career planning. So the panels would be a source for that. We wanted lots of space for feedback and assistance. So office hours and, and spacing of the workshops. And finally, and maybe most importantly, we wanted sessions to be accessible in both English and French. Uh, we weren't sure how we were going to get all the way to a completely bilingual program with the resources we had for the pilot, but we wanted to try. So making sure that everybody could speak in the language that they're comfortable in, that regardless of the language of the session that they were attending, that they would have access to materials and assistance to help them in the language they were most comfortable in. For this program, we solicited applications from both Miguel and Udem students. We used Lime Survey for the application process. Uh, we chose Lime Survey because it allows file upload and we wanted the CVs or resumes to be included as part of the application. The application itself included questions about the potential applicants interest in the program, their perspectives on technology and accessibility. In total, we received about 23 completed applications and about 10 additional applications that were partially completed. The application form was uh, translated and was available in both French and English. We spent some time thinking about how to evaluate the applications in a, as objective a way as possible and as fairly as possible. We decided to sort of apply a similar method to content analysis where you have two independent raters at least, or two evaluators in this case. Um, so that each application was evaluated by at least two of our organizing committee members. Uh, we divided them by French-English, so those folks who can read and understand French were given two applications in French, and those who um, were not able to read or understand French easily were given the English applications. We developed a rating scale, so a rubric, a very simple rubric that involved, you know, a four point scale with excellent, good, average and poor. And it, with the stipulation that if anyone would any response from an applicant was given a rating of poor, that the evaluator would have to write a comment about why they assigned that that rating. Um, and then we would discuss that. Um, so we also gave further consideration to applicants with um, 
who identified themselves as having background identities or personal lived experiences that could contribute to having an overall really diverse group of participants. That was really important to us as well. Um, and so in that case, part of the application process was to flag an application to discuss um, if that applicant self-identified as someone who might be able to contribute in that way. Uh, we also discussed applicants um, more deeply who were in Nadine's course. Um, so we had promised as part of their, uh, when we had introduced this idea to them and asked them to sort of give us some feedback on whether they would be interested in this type of um, training, we had promised that they would have um, like a higher level of consideration um, or first consideration um, to the spots that were available. So we decided to flag those as well in the application form and, or in the evaluation form to discuss further. Um, luckily, I believe all the students from Nadine's class who applied were, in, were accepted. Um, so I don't think there were any students who applied from the course that were rated or evaluated um, as poor or average, for example. Um, and then we met to discuss any discrepancies. So if there, since there were two folks, uh, two evaluators looking at each application, if one evaluator said it was excellent and the other said it was average, we all took a look at that more closely um, and had them walk us through their thought process on why they gave them that rating. So that helped to sort of take care of the fact that some folks were just unlikely to give excellent to anyone um, and others were, um, you know, and in those applications that had um, some information that was really, really compelling and some that wasn't, and then we were able to discuss that a little bit further. We ended up accepting 12, of whom 10 ended up participating in the program. So a couple of the um, applicants who we accepted were just not able to commit to a full week program at that point in time anymore. And the breakdown of the applications um, in terms of who were accepted is um, who participated. We had seven students from the Université de Montréal and we had three McGill students participating. The finalized programs include a mix of panels um, inviting librarians and information professionals from across institutions in Quebec, um, and a series of practical hands-on workshops. Uh, so the first day started with a welcome where we allowed students to introduce themselves and um, just chatted more informally since it was hosted totally virtually. Um, we wanted to make sure that the cohort felt connected to each other. Uh, we had an introductory workshop on research data management, so just this idea of organizing information in files and digital files and information to sort of set the stage for future workshops such as Git and GitHub and Python as well. Uh, we then moved into the Git and GitHub section, um, followed by uh, Q&A. We had daily check-ins in the morning and daily office hours in the afternoons. Um, our second uh, day started with a panel on career paths in library technology, where guest speakers discuss their career paths from library school to their current jobs. So the panelists provided details on the key required technological skills for their current position and whether they would have done anything differently to be prepared for their current roles. Uh, we then went, had some practical workshops on using Excel to clean up messy data and then bringing those data into open or find the same data set and further um, cleaning the data set. On Wednesday, we had a panel, What I Didn't Know When I Started, where panelists presented reflections on what they wish they knew when they first started working in technological library roles. Uh, each panelist shared at least one moment when they felt at a loss and what they did to overcome that situation or what they learned through that experience. Uh, we also had a panel on Thursday on applying to your first library job, and that's where we had a couple hiring managers actually talk about what they look for when they're hiring, including tips on writing a successful CV and cover letter, interviewing, networking, and where and how to look for jobs. And then we had an intensive double Python workshop in the afternoon. And the final day included um, a showcase of technology including that we use here um, throughout Quebec and Canada, including Borealis Dataverse, um, Easy Proxy, Sambara, and SpringShare LibApps. And then we ended with a couple workshops on digital preservation and web archiving to show sort of how to practically implement many of these skills into a job and into that setting.
And here's a cute photo of the whole group. I think we were supposed to be holding up our pets or something that we had nearby. I have a stuffed unicorn for some reason. Um, but this was all on the first day. We have learned some important lessons from running this first iteration of the program, which we will apply to our second iteration scheduled for next summer. We sent out a participant survey following the program, and I am happy to report that we had very positive participant feedback overall. That being said, based on the results of the survey and our own observations, we have a few ideas of what can be improved. In place of one-on-one -on -one tech check appointments ahead of the program week, we are considering doing group install fests that would be arranged based on type of operating system. During the program, we would like to start the week with more icebreakers, giving participants and organizers a better chance to get to know one another and to build an environment of trust and safety. We will try to use more polls throughout the week for group engagement. We would like to encourage the use of the chat function in Zoom for more informal commentary and connections. We would also consider having an in-person meetup, either to kick off the week and or to celebrate towards the end of the week as another aspect of community building. During breaks between sessions, we would encourage the use of on-camera check-ins just to get the face-to-face -face confirmation that everyone is engaging and feeling okay about the program. We also have wider considerations around the overall format of the week, such as whether to have in-person days or half days, or even to embrace a more equal distribution of time in person versus time online. In our Montreal context, we are also considering the language aspect. We attempted to do a primarily English program with simultaneous French note-taking, but we are considering whether running dual programs, as in one entirely in English and one entirely in French, might actually be more manageable. In terms of the program content, the participants found the most challenging workshop to be our Git workshop, which kicked off the week. We are considering moving it to later in the week, making time to do a workshop on command line first. We have also debated the merits of having the workshops build off each other day by day towards a final project, versus keeping the workshops independent, in an effort to ensure that even if a participant feels lost in one workshop, it doesn't limit their ability to participate in the rest. Finally, participant feedback has pointed us towards building in more contextualization, such as real-world projects and examples, to complement each workshop topic, as well as more practical and hands-on exercises for participants. In exchange, we may have less of the panel sessions and look to combine a few of our panels into one instead. Although we have a few decisions still to make, we are looking forward to building on the success of this year's program to ensure that next year's program will provide participants with what they need. Thank you all for your attention. We now look forward to answering any of your questions. Thanks very much for your presentation this morning. We're just waiting to see if any questions come through in Slido. So you're all welcome to join slido.com, use the hashtag access. Uh, will the program be open to more participants from other library schools in future years? Um, yeah, I guess I can, I'll take a stab at it. I think for now, we're still going to probably focus on the, the two Montreal library schools that we have, just, um, just as a bit of a scoping, I think, mostly. But we would encourage, I think, if anyone wanted to implement the program closer to one of the other library schools uh, in Canada, definitely, or, or the U.S., let us know, too. Um, the NCSU group was also really open to meeting, like we, they met with us before we started just to give feedback and give some advice. Um, so we would encourage it being implemented elsewhere, but for our, for our sake, we're going to probably stay focused in our area. The one thing I would like to add is that uh, we had always said that we would do this as a free endeavor, right? We want it to be uh, a cost zero except for time and uh, of course having you know access to a computer but even then we could offer support that was also the idea so if we're doing it 
partially virtually, partially in person, the distance becomes an issue if we if we go into traveling costs or anything uh, of that nature. So I think that's also why we are focusing on on Montreal to to begin with, just because we are here. But as the project grows, if anybody, as Carolyn says, if anybody wants to come knock on our door and see if we can maybe have you know, uh, sort of two jumpstart programs collaborate and maybe have some of the events be bridge events where we could have discussions of different contexts. I think that would be, you know, quite extraordinary. So that would be lovely. The questions are pouring in, so we're going to keep you for a couple more minutes. But what were some of the biggest obstacles or wins regarding bilingualism? I can take that one. <laughs> Uh, time, resources, um, in the sense that um, what often happens in these situations is that the French speakers can do some of it in English, uh, but would like to have more content in French. Um, and so I would say that uh, while some of the um, documents that were given in advance were translated, because that was pretty easy easier to do i would say timing so factoring in how much time it takes to translate so getting documents in earlier from presenters so that we can have time to translate and then simultaneous accompaniment during so it's not you know a full simultaneous translation but it was sort of on chat or on another document we were making notes in the other language and uh, the team was very small in terms of doing that um, and then the flip side is that uh, the, uh, mostly the english speakers if they had no French at all, then during some panels, we had told the presenters that they could speak in whichever language they preferred. And that might have created a bit, you know, more of a disconnect. So as, uh, you know, we said in the presentation, we are definitely looking at those questions again, not to remove the bilingual aspect, because I think we need to continue in that, in that, on that path of building those bridges. Um, but to think about more efficient ways of doing it and maybe by sort of uh, asking everyone to participate more in that uh, if they are able to so you know we're looking at it but definitely the obstacles are are more they're definitely not you know goodwill they're definitely not uh, everybody putting it a bit of effort everybody did you know both students and uh, organizers it's just time time and resources that's the big thing question for you folks. Were the Git and Python tutorials derived from existing resources, software carpentry, or handmade? Yeah, I suppose uh, it was a bit of a combination of things. Um, uh, I can speak, I know for OpenRefine and Excel, those were sort of built off of some existing workshops we had, like one existing workshop we had at McGill um, that actually Elisa was involved in, um, was used to reform a bit for our Excel. And then we did a combo with a library carpentry for OpenRefine, I think as well, as well as one from, I'm, I'm blanking, I think it was from the UVic uh, had a really great OpenRefine. It's all cited in our documents, but I can check on that. <laughs> Um, but I can hand it over. I know Kristen was involved with the Git workshop, so. <laughs> yeah, and the, the Git and GitHub was also based off of um, Library Carpentry, if I remember correctly, with some changes made for our particular context. Um, but I think that that's one in particular that we think that we can uh, improve for next year for our participants. And the um, Python workshop was also adapted from the Carpentries um, yes. workshop as well, yeah. Yeah. So we, we really appreciate your engagement this morning in capping off uh, the presentation in this way. And we'll give you some real world, real world, real room full of applause from, from Ottawa for you now. Thank you again. <laughs> Our next session, uh, starting at 1120, what if Mark really died? Experiences from using Drupal as a library system. Matthew Fesnack is from the Ontario Legislative Assembly and is going to be leading us through this, uh, this presentation this morning.
Hello. Um, so my presentation is basically about a website that was created um, for a consortial catalog um, and sort of the hacky experiences of using Drupal to do this. Uh, So the site itself is called Gallup, so that's why the presentation's kind of horse-themed. Um, <laughs> and Gallup stands for the Government and Legislative Libraries Online Publication Portal. Um, the French name doesn't exactly fit the horse theme, but it's there as well. Um, and so it's, it's a bilingual site. Um, and it was an initiative of the legislative Assembly of Ontario, uh, the library there, and so it was basically meant to enable cross-jurisdictional research, um, so the reference librarians at the legislations would take questions about what other assemblies or whatever other provinces are doing on certain topics, and to search all these individual catalogs is a pain, so they built this system. Um, but, so there's a lot of faults, and it was sort of, had loftier ambitions than it ever was able to meet, um, and it's not really essential products for any library involved, and it was never really supported uh, very much, typically only having two to three people working on it at a time, and rarely any of those people were web developers. Um, with limited contributions from other jurisdictions outside of Ontario. So this leads to a lot of unique challenges. Um, and this presentation will cover sort of theoretical benefits and real challenges. Um, so I thought this presentation would be like other pandemic present or pre-pandemic presentations where I'd sort of plug my laptop in and click through things. Um, so I have links to the site, but uh, you can also just go to those. So I sort of slapped in some slide or screenshots in lieu of clicking around the site. Um, this is sort of a last minute change, so it's a little bit incomplete, I guess. But this is sort of the site um, with me logged in, and so you can see there's a little drop down for like Gallup admin, and that was sort of like PHP modules created to make the Drupal site more like a library uh, website. And um, basically, it's just sort of mark records converted into a XML file and using Dublin Core. Um, so you can sort of see a record here, and, oh, sorry. And so you sort of have all these mark fields just sort of converted into DC fields. Um, and so we use like uh, XSLT script to do this, and XQuery as well through mark edit and Saxon. Um, so I learned a bit of command line skills to do this, but um, it really wasn't that complicated because the records weren't changing all that much. We were just sort of getting rid of local fields um, and slapping it all into a site. And so for actually accuracy's sake, I used to work at the Legislative Assembly. I guess I forgot to update the conference, but I work at McMaster now. Um, and at the time, I, this project was like one of the things I was working on a lot. Um, but since I've left, I don't think anyone's really picked it up much because I've sort of still had my login and logged in and not much has changed. And I was the last person to make any changes to the site. Um, but regardless, uh, so now I'm at McMaster. Yeah, anyways. So Gallup right now is sort of on a Drupal 9 site, and these custom modules are built. Um, so the content of the site is mostly just so like government publications, they're all a little bit dry, and people outside of government don't really look at the site ever. But uh, it has like annual reports, news releases, research publications. Um, and for each jurisdiction, they don't all include the same thing. 
Um, but what the sort of project included was to have uh, these MARC records converted into XML and then also to download PDFs of the records. Um, so these are all sort of digital files. Um, and unlike university sort of catalogs, the records themselves were mostly created by catalogers um, with little copy cataloging involved. Uh, so this is sort of a unique um, way of doing things compared to the experience of most libraries now. Um, and from the PDFs, we also OCR'd and uh, uploaded full text to the site. And so for people who don't know OCR is where you use a robot determines the characters represented in the PDF and attempts to sort of recreate them as words and sentences. And these PDFs aren't really accurate always, but still useful for searching. And so a lot of these legislations have really small libraries. Um, so this site sort of improves on their older catalog systems and provided uh, more stability in some of them in some cases as well. So some of these library websites would go down and this would sort of be an alternative. Um, but so there's also sort of complications and uh, politicians have complained about historic information being online, that it might confuse the public, that uh, they think it's current if they don't read the dates, so they're sort of like asking not to put this information online, but library staff have sort of accepted that. And um, so the actual legislative libraries aren't like scraped by Google or whatever, but this Gallup site is. Um, and so instead of having the PDFs in the website that I showed earlier, it's just a link to those library websites. Um, so it's not super accessible and causes various issues there, but um, it is what it is, I guess. Um, and so the basic workflow for this site was to get the MARC records, reformat them with an XSLT script into an XML file, uh, download these PDFs from the 856 field and OCR the PDFs and then upload them to Drupal. And so this is really sort of a simple thing that we were doing, um, but it created a lot of technical challenges, uh, mostly because we didn't have like dedicated developers working on this site. Uh, so when it was sort of built, it was built for like the regular workflows um, of uploading a few files at a time, but the initial load was like 200,000 files or a million files. And so there's a backlog when I left of like 180,000 files. And to upload them, we could only upload like 200 at a time. So the site kind of stagnated um, just because the PHP wasn't like in our wheelhouse. We couldn't really fix it. So it was just sort of built once and then left. Um, However, uh, I think this catalog sort of provides insights into issues that university libraries are just sort of dealing with passively. Um, so over the course of my career, I've worked in four different universities and they all sort of have these stories of technical services staff just being like cut from either a whole floor of catalogers or just a huge chunk of catalogers and they're cut down to like one or two catalogers for the whole university. Um, and now we sort of all rely on importing records from vendors or uh, like pre-catalog materials. And many of these records are just sort of garbage and we just kind of accept or try our best to improve them. Um, but finding materials is always kind of a challenge. And there's like all this work being done on deduping records and improving these records. So uh, this Gallup project was sort of the opposite experience where like every single record was created by catalogers and they all sort of took their time to do, make good records. Um, so in the site itself, this, in the building this site, it sort of provides this 
um, counterpoint, I guess, even though it's kind of just, the site is not very impressive because it's built by like three librarians and one developer. Um, However, like, it also sort of shows the ease that we can sort of leave Mark behind, that it doesn't really take that much work, and so that we don't need to necessarily be held back by all these things that we're sort of worried about, like sticking with uh, our old sort of standards that's been around forever. It's not really necessary that it's not that hard to sort of leave behind. And Gallup sort of presented a great opportunity to try things out with low expectations. In university settings, you can sort of see similar work being done in special digital collections where records can be manipulated or done differently than we do with the main library catalog. Um, using systems like Islandora or Wikidata and Wikibase. Um, And so for Gallup, we had, I had sort of these hopes and ambitions if I stayed at the job to make it sort of more than what it was, but um, moved on anyway, so. And looking at the OCR files, you can sort of see in this example of the full text that there's just sort of like a sentence and a point and then just random words and then another point and so here we can sort of see the limitations that even though this like full text searchable catalog is sort of like nicer than just having mark records, um, these sort of expectations aren't really lived up to in the actual uh, PDFs themselves. Um, and so the way to sort of improve this, I guess like the next sort of iteration of this site would be to focus on the PDFs themselves instead of just downloading a web page or saving a Word document as a PDF, thinking about how we can sort of uh, format the text itself with headers, tags, and other things. And in the Legislative Assembly themselves, they do this in other aspects. Uh, the Hansard debates, which are just like recordings of the uh, House, they are structuring those De uh, debates so that you can sort of search them and these are in HTML format and uh, this year um, Springer Nature had this like webinar on text and data mining and so you can see these sort of like uh, vendors doing this work but it's generally not like across the board in libraries and um, Springer Nature itself is sort of such a closed off library system, like that access to these journals is not easy and not everyone sort of wants to like pay money to put their thing in Springer. Um, but that this is sort of work that we should be doing in libraries um, in addition to sort of deduping records or improving MARC uh, <coughs> catalogs and so this is just sort of something to think about, I guess, as I move into a university library and sort of deal with familiar issues with MARC records. Um, yeah, and so I can't click around the site, but anyways, that's all for me. That's my presentation. Matthew, so we just have a comment here about Anchor Archive Zine Library does a great job using Drupal. A mention. I don't know if that resonates with you or. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I had a quick question for you. Sure. Um, I think of when you go into emergency, there's sort of like a pain chart that says zero to 10, smiley face at the end and unsmiley face to sort of, you know, talk about the pain point or how much pain you're going through. And, you know, the, with the question of, is Mark really died or not? What, how did you feel about the 
the whole conversion overall, all all the things that you were doing when you when you look back at it. Um, yeah, I found it pretty useful just to like think about not using Mark. It was an enjoyable experience um, doing so much Mark cataloging earlier in my career that the rules are just sort of there. They're not really helpful. They don't improve the data per se. Um, and that we don't really need it as much as we sort of enforce it. Um, that worrying about vendors making mark records is maybe not as important as worrying about better vendor records. Um, and that, yeah, working with XML, it was, I don't know if this is like a better data format than mark, then it seems like a useful and easy thing to do. So. Um, yeah, I hope that, like, I, I don't know, I think this April there was sort of a joke email about Terry Reese crying, about Mark dying and stuff. That sort of inspired the title. Um, yeah, I don't know. Overall, it's okay. That's it. You made yeah, it through. It was, okay. it was fine. All right, congratulations on your recent position at McMaster as well. Oh, thanks. Oh, sorry, we, we still have, have we have a couple other questions. Uh, Anything you would have done differently, gone with a different CMS? Yeah, so as far as like other CMSs, I mean, just using like Islandora with Drupal probably would have been easier because that's sort of built for libra some library tasks, even though it's not the same. So that's something I would have thought about, but um, I'm not there anymore, so I'm not thinking about it anymore. Uh, Other questions about? Did you explore using the Drupal Mark module? That's probably deprecated. No, I don't think that was still around, I guess. Or I don't know. I didn't find that, so I'm not sure. Oh, questions just disappear. That's OK. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the time we had for questions. It was okay. a pleasure to have you uh, with us this morning right. here. Hear about your work. Thank you very much. All right. Our next presentation, one of the presenters is here. The second is not. And I got to admit, just before Matthew stepped up, I was lost in the TV world, and I forgot that Matthew was presenting in person as I was stepping off. Like, uh, So I didn't even make eye contact with you. But, and I apologize for that, but I was like so thrown off. I was like, how did you teleport in, too, at the same time? So this whole hybrid thing, it's a, it's a deal where your mind's like lost in one place. So we've got on screen someone, and then the second person is here. Yes, sir. And what's your name? I don't know who's who or who's where. Julianne is on screen. Thank you. And you're Arlene. Hi, Arlene. Hey, Julianne. <laughs> All right. It's OK. It's a bit weird, eh? It's really weird. <laughs> I like keep thinking, just worry about the people in the room until the people that that I'm trying to address aren't mm -hmm. in the room, they're on screen. So, on screen, mm -hmm. we have Julianne, Ru Julianne Richardson, along with Arlene Wetter. Arlene and Julianne are from Library and Archives Canada. The subject in question that they're presenting today are the acquisitions workflows using publisher supplied metadata at Library and Archives Canada. It's all yours, Julianne. All right, well, thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us for this discussion. I'm going to apologize a bit in advance. I am a bit under the weather, um, so I will try not to. Uh, well, I will try to get through this um, in a timely fashion. So, um, my name is Julianne Richardson. I'm the manager of the Legal Deposit Program here at Library and Archives Canada, and I'm here with my colleague Arlene Wetter. She is the superhero team lead of our digital acquisitions team. Um, and we're here to share with you today our digital acquisitions workflows and how we use um, publisher supplied metadata here at LAC. So, next. Next slide, please. Joel. 
Is ever can everyone just see the first slide? No, I can I I only see the first we're still on the first slide. Uh, it's a what we see right now is March. March 3. If we can go back two slides. Okay. It's okay. If you, I can sort of remember the presentation. So if we're on slide two. What we see right now is Library and Archives Canada, who we are, guardian of the past. Is that what you'd like us to see? All right, yes. Okay, we can do this. All right, so um, Library and Archives Canada. So the National Archives and the National Library of Canada were merged under the LAC Act of 2004, creating one, um, one memory institution for all of Canada. As a memory institution, our mandate is very large, um, but for today we'll focus on the bit about the acquisition, preservation, and uh, making accessible Canada's documentary heritage. Um, Documentary heritage is the documentary and creative output of Canadians past, present and future. It includes published and non-published documents, both private and public, uh, music, film, the web. In June of this year, Library and Archives Canada unveiled its Vision 2030 strategic plan, which defines um, what we want to accomplish by 2030 or 2030. It feels so weird to say that and how we can achieve it. It provides the necessary guidance to better meet our mandate. I want to highlight three of its guiding principles. So one, we want to make our collections better known and better accessible. Uh, we want to continuing acquiring collections that reflect, oh, there we go, um, a diverse and inclusive society. And we want to work more with our partners in the community and in around the world. In the slide here, you can see this is our new preservation building in Gatineau. And despite what it looks like, we are not the Borg and we will not assimilate you. We in quite the opposite, in fact. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so our authority to collect. A quick word before I continue, acquiring, preser preserving, and making a collection accessible is a really broad topic. And so we are going to just today focus on the acquisitions and specifically the acquisitions of published materials such as monographs, um, music scores, and federal publications. So first, how does LAC go about growing its collections? Well, there's many different ways. We, uh, we have donations, we do some purchases, and we have various programs such as the Thesis Canada program. Um, but by large, we acquire our collection through the legislative mechanism of legal deposit. So uh, Section 10 of the LAC Act requires all publishers and self-publishers who um, publish a document, as in make it available to, to the public, um, they must deposit copies with Library and Archives Canada. Um, the regulations will also, uh, we don't need to go into them, but here's where you'll find the exclusions such as things, um, coloring books with no text, drafts, um, posters, these are not actively um, acquired by LAC. Next. Okay. Um, and this is a really, really quick slide. Before we move on, I just wanted to quickly show you a part of a logbook that was kept in legal in the legal deposit section at LAC way before we had computers. So on March 31st, 1959, LAC acquired seven publications and we were able to type them all in. They're all in the, the well, they're in the card catalog. Um, can you guess how many were received on March 31st, 2022? Uh, we received 228 items. So we've come a long way since then. Next. All right. So like most everything, um, documentary heritage has evolved alongside digital technology. Um, in the past, we had simple print monographs, magazines, uh, 
CDs, records, these were all tangible items. Now we have the digital versions of all of these plus much, much more. We have blogs and podcasts, social media, uh, geodata. And in order to both ensure the continuity in and to ensure an accurate representation of Canadians in the collection, LAC is prioritizing its digital capacity. Um, but were we up to it? Did our systems and workflows evolve alongside the digital as well? Next, please. Um, so the impact of digital on the publishing industry is keenly felt by LAC. Self-publishing is now easier to accomplish. Um, various platforms exist, such as Amazon, Blurb.com, draft to digital Instagram, SparkLulu.com, that basically allow anybody to self-publish their, their works. Now, it's not to say that publishing companies don't have a place, um, but it, is, it, it just means it's easier to do now. Um, as well, publishers are now releasing digital formats alongside with print ones, and often a digital format will come out long after the print has been published. Well, since 2007, the digital copy also has to be deposited with LAC. So these two things really increase the number of publications that are deposited with LAC, which means that there's a lot more work to do. Um, and finally, the dynamic nature of the digital also means that staff has to spend more time with each one determining um, whether it's subject to legal deposit, whether it's a draft or a final copy, and this happens a lot, uh, whether it's readable, whether it contains the proper metadata, whether it's a true publication, in a sense that a publication available to Canadians is subject to legal deposit. But if it's a book of poems you put together for your family and only your family, then that's not something that we would collect. Um, next slide. Mm -hmm. So with all that, how is LAC meeting this challenge? Well, we're upgrading our systems and we're trying to find efficiencies in our workflows. As you'll see in the next slide, our system has uh, was ge several generations out of date. Um, but beyond upgrading the, the digital system, uh, we try to find efficiencies in our workflows. So some of the things we did was we re-engaged with our partners, such as publishers, universities, and the depository services. We are now engaging with communities to ensure that our collection truly reflects the diverse and inclusive society that is can Canada. And we're refusing to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we're not the first to do this. So we are talking to other national libraries, to other memory institution, academic libraries. What are they doing? What systems are they using? What approach are they using? What, and what can we and what can we learn from that? What can we reuse from that? Next slide. Mm -hmm. So here is a, um, a brief timeline of uh, lack in its digital challenges or yeah, the digital challenges. So in 1994, we implemented our very first digital ingest system, aptly called EPPS or the Electronic Pilot Project System, which must be the longest project pilot project ever since it's still in, in use today, but is, is due to sunset at the end of March, 2023. We then have early attempts at the digitization ingestions of materials from within our own collections, such as the PS8000 collection of early 20th century digitized Canadiana. Uh, then came our web harvesting program, which began in 2004 and is now a big success. The program collects the Canadian web and currently sits at over 100 terabytes. Um, can anybody hazard a, uh, hazard a guess at how many selfies it contains? It contains over 50 million selfies. Um, 2004 also saw the early attempts at, our the at ingesting electronic theses. Um, and then here we are in 2022, fully embedded in the development of our workflows within our digital asset management system. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So in the interest of time, because I know I am running above my time, um, I'm going to speed this up. Earlier I spoke of lack meeting the digital challenges by upgrading our systems. Um, so check, we did that. And looking at our processes to find efficiencies, my colleague Arlene will touch on those. Next. Mm -hmm. So um, quickly, um, 
we currently have three up and running workflows within our dams. Um, so the first one is the Thesis Canada program. That was established in 1965 to acquire and preserve the master's and doctoral thesis of, um, by students from Canadian universities, which are not subject to legal deposit. Um, in 65, it started with 12 universities, and now we hold the works of over 60 universities. And we currently have over 25 universities participating in the new workflows. Uh, the Digital Monos Workflows was launched in December 2021, and we currently have over 6,000 new titles with over 1,000 um, distinct publishers participating. Um, we have also just recently completed the workflows for federal monographs and currently have over uh, 5,000 new titles. So now I will pass the floor to Arlene, who will go into detail about the acquisition workflows and how we are using publisher Applied metadata to create efficiencies in our process. Thanks, Julianne. Um, okay. Okay, that worked. <laughs> um, so generally, we've moved from using custom-built systems uh, to commercial systems for reasons that are widely recognized, um, like the benefits of regular updates and technical support from vendors. Is my mic on? Is, I'm good. <laughs> Um, newly acquired digital publications uh, and or records now move through at least uh, three systems at LAC. First, we've automated our ingest workflows with a managed file transfer application called Go Anywhere MFT. In Go Anywhere, we assemble the submission information packages and send them to Preservica. Preservica is a commercial preservation platform that we acquired a few years ago through uh, a DAMS procurement process. We store our newly acquired digital publications in Preservica. We also preserve collections on tape. Finally, finally, we send the MARC records to Aurora, which is LAC's library catalog, and WorldCat. Digital legal deposit workflows. Um, under our legal deposit mandate, LAC should be acquiring most things published in Canada in both physical and digital formats. That is a lot of stuff, and with respect to digital, we needed to find a way to be more efficient. We launched new submission forms last year, which ask for more data from publishers. This way, what we receive in the forms can be transformed into viable bibliographic records through, a, through an automated process. The online submission forms are generally used by self-publishers, by associations, and by a few smaller trade publishers. We don't expect large trade publishers to fill out these forms, given that they already have metadata in the form of Onyx records that they can submit. The British Library shared an onyx to mark XSLT with us and we've adapted it for, for LAC and we plan to launch this, this workflow in the coming months so that we can um, then begin to acquire metadata and digital publications from major Canadian publishers at a larger scale. Another active workflow using our new systems is the acquisition of theses and dissertations for the Theses Canada program. Generally, we harvest the files and metadata from the university's institutional repository. Setting up the harvest requires a lot of back and forth communication with the universities, and the universities do a lot of work to get their ETDMS data and the links to the files ready for harvesting. The benefit is that we can acquire in batches of tens of thousands of theses at a time, and our metadata transformations generate records that are good enough for the library catalog. In addition to the large-scale harvesting, we recently introduced a single thesis upload form, which small universities without a repository can use to submit theses. Our newest batch acquisitions workflow is for federal publications. We launched this workflow in the spring of 2022. Every week, approximately 200 monographs are published on the weekly acquisitions list, which is the present-day incarnation of the Gov Government's Depository Services Program, or DSP, list. DSP also produces MARC records for each title. Our new automated workflow is scheduled to acquire the MARC records, download the publications, and submit it all to Preservica every week. With DSP's cooperation and support, we automatically customize uh, and enrich their MARC data, and we upload those records to Aurora and WorldCat. For decades, our cataloging teams have selected a good portion of the DSP records to upgrade manually. However, even records not selected for full cataloging by LAC are now described in our catalog, which is a super benefit of this new workflow. 
We depend a lot on the good quality of the work done by others, by the DSP catalogers, by the universities, by publishers. We give guidance to all when appropriate to try to ensure we have good quality data coming in. Because many of our publication streams begin with data submitted in standard schema, namely ETDMS, MARC, or ONIX, the data from those streams is relatively consistent and stable. For the individual legal deposit submissions in web form, coming in from our web forms, there is a lot more variability in the data. So we use the functionality of the web form to enforce data entry standards where we, where we can, and when we can't enforce, we suggest with guidance and instructions on uh, data entry. Also, our staff review and edit the data in a custom template in Preservica. We've been really conscious about not making this custom template too complex as we don't want to recreate a cataloging module, but it's an opportunity to verify the information submitted by publishers and to edit some key fields. We also review every title submitted via web form to ensure that it is subject to legal deposit since sometimes we do receive things which are ineligible. <coughs> upload to the catalog. So we convert the metadata for all publication streams coming in uh, to Preservica to MODS, uh, to MODS records so that there's a common format for all of the, the records in our repository. An automated workflow selects new records added to Preservica and converts the MODS to MARC and spits out a MARC file. So librarians do take a close look at this MARC file before uploading to the catalog. We don't check every record but we review a few things in MARC edit and there are some common errors or problems that we look for and fix. We then upload to our catalog using the OCLC data sync collections feature. A final step is a weekly sync back uh, of the records from OCLC to Preservica, uh, where we do the metadata transformation in reverse, mark to mods, and we replace the original mods record uh, in Preservica with a new one that includes the OCLC number. This way we maintain a connection between the digital objects uh, in Preservica with their authoritative description in the catalog. The introduction of these new uh, acquisitions workflows at LAC is a departure from past practices and they've certainly created efficiencies. A single technician processing digital legal deposit submissions can acquire about twice as many titles now. However, the quality will never be as good as manual records created by a cataloger, and we regularly discover errors, unanticipated problems. We're now working through questions such as what errors should we fix, what can we ignore, also which team is responsible for fixing them. Do we need a new team with a mix of acquisitions and cataloging staff, since this doesn't fall under the umbrella of either team's previous workload? Although we don't pay for our library materials, we do have an acquisitions process to order and receive most publications in the acquisitions module in our ILS so that we can send legal deposit receipts. There's an example of an emailed legal deposit receipt up there to U of A Press. Um, <clears throat> and also run statistical reports on our acquisitions. This is an extra step and it takes additional time. When designing the workflows, we considered uh, not doing this step for all digital publications, but in the end we decided on a hybrid approach. For the ingest processes where a legal deposit receipt is not required, namely the theses harvesting program and the federal publications workflow, um, we don't do this step. We just keep manual stats in a spreadsheet, which is man manageable given the, the nature of those publication streams. But for publications that require a legal deposit receipt, uh, we decided to order and receive in the acquisitions module so that we can send receipts in the same way we would for analog materials and we can run the same type of stats report as we do for analog. So public access to our digital collection is provided through the catalog. We offer two types of public access, open or restricted. Price publications are always restricted access and can only be viewed on site in our Ottawa reference room. In addition to the catalog, LAC has a process to pull all of our records from OCLC into a database, uh, which is used to populate our collection search feature, uh, which is like a federated search of our archival and library collection on our website, as well as the Theses Canada search portal. The access online button or full text links lead to a dynamically generated resource landing page, which looks like this. Uh, if it's an open access publication, we have a little bit of metadata uh, pulled in for uh, like a citation at the top from the MODS record uh, in Preservica displayed there. 
uh, and it lists the files in that title folder. So if it's a multi-file publication, it'll list uh, more than one file. If it's a restricted access publication, uh, you get the on-site only, on access only message. A complete redevelopment of this uh, landing page or um, item display page is in the work plan for the coming year, including perhaps uh, an embedded document viewer in addition to a nice way to display and access serial issues, which we currently don't have. Um, we're often asked by publishers and universities about preservation. How are we ensuring the long-term storage, viability, and accessibility of the digital resources in our published heritage collections? With the acquisition of Preservica, we now benefit from uh, many of the preservation features in that software. Uh, some of them are listed here. We also still do export collections from Preservica uh, onto tape, and we store two copies in tape in our vaults. Finally, um, our next challenge, which we're currently working on, is to develop workflows to accommodate serial publications. Um, new workflows for serial publications. We're looking at how we'll store the metadata for serial issues uh, within Preservica, and that work will need to be aligned with the uh, development work for our new resource landing page. We also need to develop the submission mechanisms for publishers, what types of forms will they use, how will they transfer the files. After serials, we'll turn to digital music. Um, we have the legal deposit mandate at LAC to acquire digital music produced in Canada. We do collect CDs, vinyl records, anything produced for sale in a physical format, um, but a lot of music is distributed now digitally only, and we are very aware of what we're missing out on by not collecting this. Um, it's a daunting challenge, but uh, and given the usual, sorry, given the usual constraints uh, of time and resources, um, <clears throat> it's a challenge, but we are happy with the progress we've made so far, and we'll continue to do our best to acquire more of Canada's digital published heritage. The end. Hang out, yeah. Just a second. Okay. Thank you very much, Julianne and uh, Arlene. I think I'll take a moment just to thank the tech crew that's running the show here, too, for having done such a great job on flexibly, very flexibly having navigated that. And my intent isn't to keep us long from lunch, but just to see if there were any questions to roll in. I had a quick question to you, Julianne. You mentioned other uh, places not wanting to reinvent the wheel necessarily, but being in touch with other corners. I was wondering if there's other corners of the world that are maybe seeing, like have a standard of, of doing things. You talked about referring to other institutions that might be going through processes, and if, if there's any place in the globe that seemed to be getting this right for either of you. Germany. Um, that's, that's a loaded question. Uh, I think a lot, a lot of the national libraries and a lot of academic libraries, they're all on the path to doing some of this. Um, I know the British Library, um, they are a bit more advanced than us. And in fact, we, um, they were kind enough to let, uh, give us, and I'm going to get this wrong, this is more about an Arlene question, but the, the, the metadata trans, or the metadata walk throughs or the yeah the walkthroughs for some of the metadata in in the system they were um happy to share that so we were able to reuse that um we you know we often talk to uh bnq um that's the uh, bibliothèque nationale du québec about workflows we share best practices we um we try to help each other out um if you're looking for someone who's a little bit more advanced, I would have a look at the um, the National Library of Australia. Arlene? Yeah, we're currently looking at Australia's uh, serials uh, workflow. It seems really sophisticated. So that's something we're admiring right now and trying to work through whether we can copy parts of what they do. Mm -hmm. um, we have the question, ETD submissions. ETD submissions provide a URL. Is that downloaded, parsed, stored, or any collections full text searchable? Full text uh, searchable, um, no, not right now. 
Um, I don't know what you mean by the first part, ETD, uh, the URL downloaded parsed store. Do you, do you mean the, the file itself or? The theses uh, provide a URL. Provide a URL. Is that downloaded, parsed, or stored? We definitely do provide access to the university's URL in our records, if, if that's, and then also a URL in the record to a copy on, a, on our own servers or in, in Preservica. I think it means if the ETD submission provides a URL, like an original URL, along with it, if it in case it's somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's it We're for good. questions. <laughs> Thank you both once again. I'd also like to again thank Andy and OCLC for having sponsored the Dave Binkley Memorial Talk this morning and for Jordan Hale for kicking us off with just the right tone. It was just fantastic. Thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> we've got a room full of people. Um, and now to lunch. So lunch is just next door. We're going to reconvene at 1.30. You guys have been a great audience already. I don't want to keep you any further. Um, naturally sort of follow your nose and I think just go through there. vegan and any sp individual dietary sort of preferences. It's the, the food is there, it's just a matter of getting the signage to go with it. So it's on its way, but if you have any questions, just take a second and ask. Don't ask me though. <laughs> I've been here, I haven't been looking who's putting what where.
big battle. It was just back and forth on the.
Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm Carolyn Sullivan, and I'm the systems librarian at University of Ottawa. And I'm going to be your convener for the next little while. Um, our next session is on the IMLS grant update, a Fedora Migration Paths and Tools pilot project. And this is a taped presentation. And it's presented by Aaron Griffith, Robin Rugeiber, and Amy Vallow. So Aaron is the Fedora Program Manager, which is an open source repository management platform whose organizational home is at Lyricist. Aaron joined Fedora back in 2020 as a community engagement coordinator and stepped into the full-time program manager role in May 2022. She has a diverse background in customer relations and sales and brings a unique set of tools and ideas to the Fedora community. Robin Rudgeiber works as the Director for Strategic Technology Partnerships and Initiatives for the University of Virginia Library. She has drawn the complex problems facing the digital stewardship community and sees the effort of communities like access as critical to bringing people together to address those challenges. And Amy Blau is scholarly communications librarian at Whitman College. Her major responsibilities are in reference and instruction and repository management, data services, web archiving, and open access and OER are additional areas of interest. So thank you so much to these folks for coming. And we're about to start. So hi there and welcome. My name is Erin Griffith and I'm the Fedora Program Manager. I'm joined today by Amy Blau from Whitman College and Robin Regaber from the University of Virginia. And we're gonna share with you an overview and an update on the IMLS grant that we've been collaboratively working on for the last two years. So the grant we're here to talk about today is the Fedora Migration Paths and Tools Pilot Project Grant. It was awarded by IMLS to the DuraSpace Community Supported Programs Division of Lyricis to help fund the development of tools and pathways, along with all of the corresponding documentation to aid in migrations from Fedora 3 to Fedora 6. So it was originally proposed as an 18-month project, which started in September 2020. Last year, we were granted a no-cost 18-month extension in order to help complete work that fell off schedule because of things like COVID and some other factors that the pilot partners will share in a little bit. So this grant was specifically focused on Fedora 3 to Fedora 6 migrations and involved the two pilot institutions that I mentioned earlier, who were both running Fedora 3 instances, but with two different front ends, which is representative of the majority of our user base. So the team in included the University of Virginia and Whitman College, along with the program team at Fedora, which consisted of Danny Bernstein, and originally it was David Wilcox, who would represent Fedora throughout. And there was also support from the team at Born Digital who helped out on the Whitman migration. So we know that Fedora 3 is one of the most widely used versions of the software that exists. And there are many libraries and archives around the world who are using this old unsupported version of the software to preserve and deliver their content to their patrons. But it's this continued reliance on Fedora 3 that puts the stability, security, accessibility, and the potential functionality of these repositories at risk. So our focus really needed to be on opening up pathways and lowering barriers to migrations in order to help get these users out of these old, outdated versions of Fedora and move them forward to the newest, most modern version, which is Fedora 6. As part of a planning grant, which preceded this grant, it was determined that there was a need for comprehensive documentation to help users navigate the daunting migration task, as well as for tools to make the process itself easier. So the goal and purpose of this grant was to actually pilot those migrations at our two partner institutions, document their entire process, as well as make publicly available all of the resources, templates, and things that they use to get from Fedora 3 to Fedora 6. So all of this data was then compiled into a master document, or what we call the migration toolkit, which would then act as the guidebook for migrating out of Fedora 3. 
So this grant was actually broken down into three phases. Phase one was to actually pilot the migrations. So this involved establishing the project plans for each pilot partner and begin documenting everything along the way. So from this, we got some really great resources that are available within the migration toolkit. And I would encourage you to check them out from the resources at the end of this slide deck. So phase two involved improvements to both the tools that were created as well as the documentation that corresponded to it. So once people started to pick up things like the migration utils and actually use them, there were bug fixes and performance improvements that went along with that. And ensuring that we were keeping on top of updating all of the documentation was a big part of the iteration process. During this phase, David was also instrumental in outlining and planning the shape and concept for the migration toolkit, along with input from both pilot partners. And lastly, phase three, which is what we're at the tail end of right now, is all about getting these tools in the hands of the communities that need them. So this past June, we released the migration toolkit for community review and feedback. Originally, we intended to present this toolkit in a hands-on kind of in-person workshop type event and bring users together to actually test out the material and see the tools in action. But after several community polls, we determined that maybe we needed to pivot one more time and create some digital training materials that will be a little bit more evergreen and that people can access in their own time when they are ready to migrate. Uh, just a little note here, as you can see, most of the timelines that were originally established uh, had quite a bit of change and shifting from the original projected timelines. And this is simply because things take time. Um, between COVID and a continual reevaluation of the scope of work at each step, we needed to make adjustments as we went. So like I mentioned earlier, we were granted this 18 month extension from the original completion date in order to accommodate any outstanding work and ensure that we were able to deliver all of the items that we outlined in the grant proposal. Hi, this is Amy Blau to tell you about Whitman College's pilot project. At Whitman, we had previously been on Islandora 7 with Fedora 3 on a site that was hosted in AWS. At the time of migration, we had around 9,000 objects from scholarship and archival, museum, and gallery collections. These objects represented a variety of object types, including images, born digital and digitized documents in PDF, audio and video files, binary files, newspapers, paged content, as well as compound objects, which included most different object types. In preparation for our migration, we underwent a rigorous metadata cleanup project. Afterwards, we worked with our grant partners, Lyricis, our site vendor Born Digital, and Alan Stanley, to construct our new site and migrate our digital objects. In order to migrate our legacy collections into a new Islandora site, while maintaining as much of our previous functionality as possible, in consultation with our grant partners, we put together a set of functional requirements for our new site and provided information about collection structure, object displays, and access terms. We successfully migrated our digital objects and metadata to a new island or a site that resembles our previous repository. One important new aspect of functionality was S3 bucket storage in the Fedora layer as part of our AWS hosting. Our migration workflow, executed by Alan Stanley, used Islandora Workbench and Google Sheets to ingest metadata and digital objects. Objects were pulled in via URL from the legacy site or for access restricted items via URL from an IP restricted Amazon bucket so that these items would not be exposed on the open internet. Of course, there were some challenges. These included delays around the initial build of our site due to dependencies in platform development and some storage architecture issues that emerged during ingest requiring remediation. As the site was populated, we identified significant performance issues around access control and search speed. These were resolved before cutover. All of these issues are now fixed or documented for new migrations. Some of the legacy Islandora functionality we had hoped for, such as a book viewer, was not available to us in time for our cutover. Work is being done in the Islandora community to develop this and other desired functionality. We hope to integrate newer work into our site as resources permit. Based on our experience migrating to the new Islandora, we recommend planning for metadata migration as early as possible and remediating metadata ahead of time, no matter what system you start from. Moving from mods used in legacy Islandora to the new Islandora's fielded RDF model requires careful mapping, but more generally, it is easier to map and migrate clean metadata than messy metadata. And the metadata cleanup process in the new Islandora isn't necessarily straightforward. 
We also recommend looking carefully at your functional requirements to determine if all features are available and what development of additional features you can budget for. We made some compromises based on limitations of time and budget. Perhaps most important is communicating regularly with the entire migration team and documenting the migration throughout the process from planning and scoping the project through cutover. This helps to ensure that expectations are shared across the team and the issues are identified and solved quickly. Now to Robin and the University of Virginia. Good afternoon. I'm Robin Regaber and I work for the University of Virginia Libraries. Our migration pilot's primary goal was to reduce risk to legacy content. For this project, we focused on an older version of Fedora, Fedora 3 repository, providing access to content through a custom front end. Through this pilot, we learned that we had 419,000 objects that ranged from photographic collections, digitized stacks, and scalable images to outdated spectrometry files and text encoded files. We knew that a portion of this content was accessible copies that were now being served out of a IIIF server. We also realized that for some of the collections not being served out of this repository, the metadata was outdated. But it was really what we didn't know that was a concern. We didn't know about all of the collections in the repository. We didn't have a staff who understood that older version of the Fedora software, and we're really reluctant to touch the server for fear that it would fail. And we didn't know what kind of hardware requirements we needed uh, for a newer version of Fedora. But it was really what we didn't know about the collections that drove the decision to migrate all the content and not just portions to a new platform. The pilot also gave us an opportunity to contribute back to the community by being an early pilot, we were able to inform migration utility enhancements and hopefully also pave the way for an improved migration experience for others. Taking the approach to migrate everything, we encountered performance issues and the need for things like progress reporting. This experience informed both feature and performance enhancements. Given that most of the UVA production services leverage cloud computing, we contributed to cloud installation capability and through an iterative process and form a performant AWS configuration. In the end, we were successful in validating a migration of our legacy content Fedora 3 over to a new version of Fedora, Fedora 6. This project presented multiple hurdles for us. As I said, we had limited knowledge of the legacy technology we had minimal knowledge of the content, and we did not have upfront Fedora 6 hardware requirements, particularly for AWS. Having also fully remote staff due to the pandemic introduced specific problems. We had communication issues and migration hardware choices that caused significant delays in the project. So our strong recommendation is upfront to know your content and to include ramp up time, not only for your technology staff that are going to have to learn how to work with that older version of the software, but also your metadata experts and get those metadata experts involved early in the pilot. Also establish the Fedora 6 hardware requirements upfront, considering your specific needs. And finally, consider iterating a migration of one collection until you have the configuration that you want, and then migrate everything. Trying to migrate everything for us on every iteration introduce further schedule delays. So I can't stress enough that the approach to divide and conquer would provide a better migration experience. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Erin. Thank you. So thank you, Amy and Robin, for sharing your migration stories. There was some really valuable information in there, and uh, I want to thank you for joining us to, to talk about that.
So I just want to go back to talk really briefly here about some of the grant deliverables that we've been able to accomplish. The biggest and probably most important is that migration toolkit itself, which I mentioned before. So this is truly a comprehensive document, which includes everything that one might actually need to make the migration from Fedora 3 to Fedora 6. Um, in it, there are user stories, best practices, templates for handling and cleaning up metadata. There's links to all the tools, as well as instructions for actually making the migration itself. So before the end of the grant period, our hope is to have the training materials formalized for distribution to the communities. So we've consulted with an instructional designer to help break the toolkit down into module type instructions that anyone could download and use. So the idea here is to make sure that the content is readily available for users when they are ready for it. It will also allow us to make sure that the material is accessible to everybody by providing it in a downloadable format that people can access at any time from anywhere and ideally in multiple languages. So other grant deliverables that are in active use, we have the migration utils, which is the actual framework that's used to migrate your data from Fedora 3 to Fedora 6. So what it does is it moves all the Fedora 3 Foximal files over to a Fedora 6 Oxford Common File Layout compliance structure. So if you're unfamiliar, Oxford Common File Layout is a uh, data standard that was created and established by the OCFL editorial board. And you can read more about that at OCFL.io. We also have the Migration Validator, which is a tool that's used for validating that all of your content was actually moved over and moved over correctly. There's this intensive and comprehensive metadata remediation guide created by the team at Whitman. In this document, there are tools, templates, and helpful links, and they've shared uh, best practices throughout the document, which has proven extremely helpful. So lastly, there's the migration guide itself. And this is actually just the step-by-step -step instructions for physically migrating to Fedora 6. You can download and have a look at this migration guide at any point in time. It is available to the community. Um, it will be what we use to work with the instructional designer to create those modules for migrations uh, for the future. But please feel free to have a look at this document as it exists right now. So this is really what's left to do. I've already talked a little bit about the toolkit and what we have uh, remaining there. As I mentioned, we had originally hoped to do an in-person migration camp type event. But again, um, you know, we're hearing from the community that there isn't exactly a critical need for this type of event. And, and that's really coming about for two reasons. One of those reasons being COVID and gathering, um, plus travel budgetary cuts at institutions. So people are still leery about making the travel to gather in person and, and participate in an event like this. And the number two reason is that people aren't ready yet. You know, because of where Fedora sits in the stack, if you're familiar, um, you know, we integrate with systems that sit on top and below. And what we're hearing is that there's a lot of, a lot of hesitancy to migrate because people are waiting for a different part of their technology stack to be ready, you know, for X, Y, Z um, to be at a state before they're ready to migrate their whole thing. And, and that just makes sense to us. So while we're not planning to do this migration workshop in person, we have done a few migration workshops already at different conferences that we've attended. So David Wilcox and Danny Bernstein actually gave a virtual migration workshop in 2021, which is available on our YouTube channel. Danny, is, Danny and I presented a Fedora workshop at Open Repositories in Denver in June 2022. Um, I also gave a workshop at iPres in Scotland, which just took place at the end of September. And I just returned from presenting another workshop at Learn at DLF, which just concluded in Maryland. Um, so uh, any recordings from those conferences, I would encourage you to check them out if you have questions about uh, the content. And then of course, there's the final grant report, which is gonna summarize everything and be submitted with IMLS for publication. So we're really close, you know, I, you can almost taste it. And I think that little snail there is kind of representative of how we feel. Um, you know, we inch closer to the finish line and then it seems like the finish line inches further away from us. But uh, we're really looking forward to getting those materials in your hands and we hope that you're as excited about them as we are. So I just want to take a moment and give a special shout out and a thank you to all of the folks listed here. Um, they were very instrumental in ensuring that this grant was seen through to completion and we couldn't have done it without all of their dedication and commitment. I also wanted to mention that all the links that we talked about today are available in our slide deck. So I encourage you to go through them and check them all out.
You can uh, join the Fedora conversation at any time if you'd like by joining one of our open weekly tech meetings. So they take place every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, I would encourage you to join the Fedora Slack and uh, we, we generally recommend the general tech or migration channels as good starting points. But thank you again from all of us. Uh, we've appreciated you having us. Thank you so much, Erin, Amy, Robin, for that excellent presentation. If folks would like to get in their questions and answers, we have one already. Um, and they are asking, is Islandora the preferred or only repository front end for Fedora 6 at the moment? Hey, I'm not sure if you can hear me. However, uh, it sounds like I can hear myself there. So um, yes, Islandora is you. not the only, oh, great. Um, Islandora is not the only front end that is available. Um, there are some other um, open source options in the Samvera suite of applications, and they have uh, connections to Fedora 6 and uh, versions of Fedora as well. Um, our users typically um, use one of those two open source options or they would roll, excuse me, roll their own front end for display for their users. Thank you so much. Any other last minute questions? Great. Well, let's give you a round of applause. We're so happy to have Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So our next speakers are Craig Harkema and Jim Clifford, and they are presenting Agile Archives, Lessons from a COVID Community Archive Project. Craig Harkema is the Digital Initiatives Librarian and Faculty Lead of the Digital Research Center at the University of Saskatchewan and Jim Clifford is an environmental and digital historian of 19th century London and the British world and an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you. So obviously Jim's not here, he bailed on me. Um, but good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to first pay my respects to the Algonquin people, uh, the traditional custodian of the land on which uh, Carleton University campus is situated. Um, and from where I live and work in Saskatoon, which is Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Um, there's a bit, you know, there's a lot of COVID talks out there. Um, I think we've had a few at access uh, in previous years, including one or two of the kind of, uh, we created a, an archive kind of uh, talks. Um, I think Aaron Wolf's Documenting Crisis was one in, in 2022. Um, of course, my glasses are fogging up. I'm going to focus mostly on the sort of emergent or urgent archive uh, response and our way of handling it. Uh, and it's much to do with the sort of web archiving side of things, uh, mostly. Um, there are some issues here that are not unique to the pandemic, um, but we, uh, they sure highlighted a few things during that time, uh, and hopefully some are applicable to your situation. Um, there we go. Um, I'll start with a bit of background, uh, discuss some partnership and collaboration challenges we had, and move into more of the sort of specifics and, and what we're up to next kind of uh, scenario. Uh, so hopefully this won't be another how we coped or are coping with COVID type conversation, um, but we'll get into more of that. Um, like many of us who are concerned with how the pandemic would play out, uh, the, the project started mostly as an attempt um, for me to gather as much as I could early in 2020. Uh, it involved into a bit more of a, a research focus when, um, Erica uh, Dick and Jim Clifford uh, got on board. They're both history profs at USASC. Um, and this brought sort of different approaches, research groups, support structures, and, and resources into the mix over the couple of years that we've been working together. 
I started, I guess, simply by just trying to catch as much as I could and archive it. Um, and I, to be honest, didn't have a ton of experience with that. And so some of the scoping and um, just working with the tool uh, took a bit of time to kind of get dialed. Uh, also worked on scraping tweets from, uh, from, from Twitter, like Scott Moe, Charlie Car Clark, uh, the Saskatchewan Health Authority among them. I focused on Saskatchewan mostly because I wasn't sure it was all being captured. Um, we had some conversations in, with provincial archives uh, and I knew there was a few national initiatives getting some stuff but we weren't sure how much and how deep and once Jim and Erica were involved we kind of had a lot of discussions about what we would get and, and what we um, what we would exclude I guess so again scoping was a, was a big issue. Also brought on Tim Hutchinson at that time as well, um, who is our university archivist, mostly to kind of keep us in check and uh, help us manage the archive collection. I should also add that Brock's project, COVID-19 in Niagara was on my radar. Uh, they were doing such a good job at setting up that site early in the pandemic, uh, got a lot of press and uh, many of you probably know Tim and Cal among others who worked on that project. It was definitely a, you know, an inspiration in terms of getting community contributions. Um, and um, our projects teams would later kind of come into contact a bit more during uh, the Archives Unleashed work, but I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more later. So early in the pandemic, we built a website where members of the community could upload material um, and sort of reflect on their experiences during the pandemic. We received some like, uh, some media attention and there was a bit of uh, there's a few submissions early on but it kind of I think COVID fatigue set in and the project went dormant for much of 2021. Early in year two I guess like right around then uh, um, kind of conference or um, grant season we kind of received some more funding so we we uh, a project called Remember and Renew was an interdisciplinary project funded by two grants, one from SHRC and one from CIHR. And this expanded, obviously, the team quite a bit. And uh, the, you know, the gist of it was to try to learn lessons from the COVID-19 response in, uh, in Saskatchewan. The CIHR project created a population survey focused on substance abuse or substance use, sorry, mental health and food and housing insecurity. And the Shirk project began work on uh, archiving community partners, works and documents and uh, uh, interviewing leadership. Uh, Jim Clifford and I applied for Archives Unleashed grant to start exploring the web archive or to sort of kickstart and help us get going on the web archiving side of things. So overall, a pretty eventful couple of years, despite not having a ton of time to kind of devote to the work. Um, we did find ways to kind of automate, get students involved and, and find some funding to, to get things going. So as I see it though, there's, there's a few key challenges. I'm taught to say challenges and not problems uh, that we would like to learn from. I'm taught to say learn from and not sort of get swamped by or dwell on. <laughs> Um, but many of them are sort of general challenges around archiving content and creating collaborative digital projects uh, in a fast moving context. So essentially we're, we're really slow, <laughs> you know, um, we're slow to react to these kinds of things. Archival work, especially at academic institutions, maybe not especially government as well and, and others. Um, the sort of grant funding, the group decision making, tool building, learning, um, all not super fast unless you have policies and procedures uh, and expertise all sorted out kind of beforehand. Um, and then two, like the information is, is not slow, it's fast, it's super fast. Um, Twitter, Facebook, online news releases, that sort of thing. Uh, it's basically a, you know, Max Verstappen versus Gia the house cat sort of situation. Um, and uh, so we didn't get overly involved. This is another problem in the sort of national web archiving initiatives at the time. We were kind of, again, overwhelmed a bit and just trying to do what we could do. That would have helped. Um, and, and also just, again, the, the time was, a, was an issue. We were all doing this off the side of our desks and had other um, concerns during the early part of the pandemic. So 
sorry, I'm going to go back. So this, the scale of it was also something we were unaccustomed to. Uh, we're used to working, I guess, on fairly big projects, uh, digitization projects, that sort of thing, um, and dealing with web archiving on a smaller scale. But we, we had, you know, I think currently it's around two, two and a half terabytes of data, 34 million um, documents. And these numbers, you know, maybe a bit inflated with some overlap, um, but still, it, you know, that's a, it's a pretty big collection to deal with. And then we had to deal with different scales. So we have, along with this, we have smaller curated archives of, you know, 3,000-ish news stories, smaller yet ar archives from community organizations, and even smaller sort of oral history collections that we're developing. So it's a, it's a real mix of, of content sizes, which um, brings about their own, their own set of challenges. Um, we also had issues around, I guess, exactly what the role of the librarian, the role of the archives in the library, and the role of the Digital Research Center are. Um, some, again, some of these are, are unique to uh, the COVID situation, and others are just, you know, simply a, a, an organization challenge, a collaboration challenge. So the community contributed content is different from other archival uh, collections we've worked with. Um, we didn't, you know, go through the typical accessioning, donation, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that uh, left uh, Tim a little, with a little bit of anxiety <laughs> and we had to kind of figure out a way to kind of, again, react and get some of the self-submission stuff going. Um, um, and more questions surfaced about how the collaboration would work, who's responsible for what, and that sort of thing. Um, we had to concern ourselves with active research of epidemiology, uh, epidemiologists who are working on the team and the goal in creating an archive to support future research beyond the sort of narrow goals of that CIHR grant. Um, getting back to the DRC though, um, we did, we were useful in a few ways, I guess, and that was, I guess, comforting for some of us. Uh, it was good for, you know, knowledge translation and, and communication, connecting programmers, archivists, um, and uh, digital li librarians with subject matter research researchers and um, um, so that was helpful. We had, we have um, infrastructure so we were able to get a website up relatively quickly um, and because of our sort of existing Drupal infrastructure which um, we'll talk a little bit more about tomorrow as well. Um, and then we had a dedicated programmer, um, sort of, uh, <laughs> Emmett, uh, who's, who's here, um, who is, you know, was there to kind of help us with a few um, introductory issues with uh, solar search tools and helping refine Twitter scraping and that sort of thing. I'll jump back. So um, the ongoing work. So kind of what's happening now is, um, I guess, in the summer we had 10 students, um, which was great. We had 10 students working sort of part-time, um, and they created Zotero collections of, you know, 3,000 news stories-ish um, on the COVID-19, uh, on COVID-19 in Saskatchewan, and worked through uh, creating metadata, tagging them, that sort of thing. Um, and they also conducted some oral interviews, and they looked at uh, the challenge of uh, Facebook, which um, I'll talk more about. But initially what was involved there is, is simply, um, grabbing as much content, uh, content using Web Recorder and other tools. Um, so that, you know, that work uh, is all being gathered together with the hope of one day uh, coming together under one, one project. Um, I'll skip ahead actually. So, Getting lost here. Um, the the we're currently updating the website, hiring students uh, to help solicit materials and interviews from community organizations. So that's kind of an ongoing thing, and we're gathering documents from different frontline organizations, food banks, nurses unions, that sort of thing. Nurse, nurses union. Um, as restriction as restrictions relax, the frontline workers in some sectors shifted from crisis to burnout, and the need to collect impressions and experiences uh, became more urgent. 
in Saskatoon, the interagency task force was formed to manage the pandemic between dozens of organizations like the food bank, shelters, and uh, safe consumption sites. This group is in the process of disbanding and the leadership is sort of dispersing into new roles. And so we thought that uh, it was important for us to collect these records before they're lost. Facebook. Um, so here's, uh, again, another challenge, um, which I'll get to on one of Jim's um, questions about how Facebook versus Twitter is operating. So as many of you likely know, Facebook doesn't play nice with the Internet Archive. Um, but it's very much the site of, uh, of much public debate about COVID measures. Um, again, we're using tools to kind of try to capture some of that. It's very labor intensive and the, the automated crawls don't do super well with this. Um, this is one area where um, Scott Moe and public comments um, sort of crept into a lot of his posts and there's a lot of interesting stuff there that we would like to make sure that we're, we're capturing. I mentioned some of the challenges, such as getting the crawls um, to capture what we wanted and some of the redundancy and the sheer size. Um, this is a pretty common problem. Um, we're getting a lot of stuff and we don't have a lot of time and we need to organize it, all that kind of thing. Um, thankfully, with the, with the Shirk Funding and Archives Unleashed project, um, it's giving a, us a bit of an opportunity to test out uh, the collection and, and the tools and, and see what we can do around um, organizing some of it. Uh, in April, we we found out our proposal for the Archive Unleash uh, team cohort um, was um, successful. I believe maybe Sam Fritz presented here in 2019 about some of what's going on with Archives Unleashed, but it's essentially a project that has um, created tools for librarians, archivists, uh, and researchers to discover, explore, uh, and analyze uh, web archives. Um, and the project uses a sort of cohort um, model. So there's a couple of, of us, uh, of the teams going through, they meet together and, and discuss like problems. Um, I'm gonna zip through, I'm running low on time. We have a grad student working with us, um, Derek, uh, who is looking at sort of the um, anti-vax movement, misinformation and networking from the 90s through to, um, through to uh, the COVID archive, or through to the you know, 2020s. His biggest challenge will be to access and retrieve older work files from the Internet Archive. So we're kind of trying to work together with these large web scrapers uh, with some of the tools and, and see if we can uh, help him sort, analyze, and, and make available some of the information that he's uh, digging into. So yeah, that's a quick blast through what it is that we're up to uh, and how we're approaching some of these, um, I guess, bigger issues uh, to do with uh, rapidly moving situations and archiving them. So thank you. don't know if we have time for so much for that Craig about all your significant work in storing local community history fascinating um, I don't think that we have time for questions so we'll be moving on to the next presentation which is PDF pit stops in library platforms an essential feature for blind users and this is a remote presentation by Ashley Shaw, Mark Wheeler, Bart Kavula, Matt Thomas, and Annette Quack. And Ashley Shaw is a master's student in community psychology at Wilfrid Laurier University. She studies inclusive workplaces and employment interventions for adults who are blind. Mark Kawula is the Web and Discovery Services Librarian at Scholars Portal. Bart's work focuses on the development of library applications that connect students and faculty to the expansive digital collections created by Ontario's university librarians. And Mark Wheeler is the Web and User Experience Librarian at Wilfrid Laurier University. Mark is cited and certified with the JAWS screen reader. 
Matt Thomas is a librarian too at Laurier Library with the title of Electronic Resources Librarian responsible for ensuring access to the collection and supporting evaluation and record keeping. And Annette Quack is the Information Services and Instruction Librarian at DG Ivy Library, New College, University of Toronto. Her research and program development interests focus on ideas of social responsibility and equity with a focus on accessibility in libraries and library services. Please give them a hand. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Shaw, and I'm a master's student in the Community Psychology Program at Wilfrid Laurier University. And welcome to our presentation entitled PDF Pit Stops in Library Platforms, an Essential Feature for Blind Users. Uh, with me today are Mark Weiler, Bart Kula, Matt Thomas, and Annette Quack. Um, and to assist those who are blind this afternoon, uh, you'll hear a click that marks the transition between slides, as you heard just there. So I love libraries and I love doing research, but every time I open new journal articles, I feel a sense of trepidation about what I'm going to get. Many journal articles are only available in PDF format. And as a blind researcher using a screen reader, the PDF format presents me with a number of accessibility barriers. Uh, the creators of PDFs typically do not verify accessibility using a screen reader, which means the first people who experience the PDF using the screen reader are usually end users like myself. I tend to waste a lot of time during searches simply checking all available copies of an article um, to fi figure out which one's the most accessible. I have to do this since there has essentially been no proofreading of the layer of text my screen reader has access to. In many PDFs, the layer of text accessible to screen readers is full of spelling errors, missing spaces between words, has unclear reading order, contains no descriptions for images, and lacks identifiable headings, links, tables, footnotes, references, and page numbers. Barriers like these create a second-class reading experience for library patrons who use screen readers. Instead of focusing on comprehension or making connections between content concepts, we're distracted by missing or incorrect content. We can't skim through long articles when properly formatted headings aren't used. And statistic and scientific symbols are often not available or incorrectly represented, which deprives us of the same opportunities to interpret data as our peers who are not print disabled. We also can't be certain that the text we're quoting directly is actually accurate and cannot create proper citations without access to page numbers. The good news is that it is entirely possible to generate content that is fully accessible to screen reader users. This is known as born accessible content, a term you may have heard before. However, retrofitting or remediating existing files that are inaccessible is time and resource intensive, especially in the case of PDFs. For my master's thesis, I am conducting a scoping review and we have needed to design a remediation workflow for the 215 articles eligible for full text screening. Inaccessible journal articles have resulted in additional time and financial costs throughout the process project so I have to wait for accessibility remediation before screening full texts and pay for things like extra file storage. As a graduate student, I've learned scoping review protocols from my mentors, but have needed to spend a lot of time and energy helping design a workflow just so I can read the same journal articles anyone else can read without a second thought. We're going to discuss the components of this workflow with you today. Given what I've just described, the fact that publishers and vendors continue to provide inaccessible copies of content is frustrating and disheartening. The fact that I, am an, as an end user, am expected to identify inaccessible content and request remediation indicates that the system is designed to offload barriers such as these onto patrons. Continuously requesting assistance with remediation requires a good deal of emotional and explicit labor on the part of patrons with disabilities 
and this labor is not required of patrons without disabilities. There are so many accessibility barriers with library reading materials that I and many others prioritize which request we request help with while giving up on others and living with them. I'm incredibly grateful to the individuals who have chosen to accompany me on this journey, and most of them are presenting with me here today. Together, we are solution focused, innovative and creative, and this collaborative focus on solutions is what I call for from others within library systems. When Ashley uh, met with me to get ahead of the obstacles in her path, I became aware of the problems libraries were presenting to blind screen reader users. The quality of journal articles and their discovery were just two of them. Although we talked about the solutions for her, Ashley also wanted to think about think beyond any band-aids and address root problems so others won't have to go through what she is going through. So we imagine a PDF pit stop integrated into discovery layers as these images show. Next to the download PDF link is a pit stop link, which sends the article to a pit stop where someone finds an acceptable version of, of it or transforms it into whatever format the print disabled reader needs. Our design has assumptions. First, a powerful creative force in the world is toppling dominant structures to make the gifts of disability be part of our lives. Second, the legacy of disabled activists have been clearing the path for us. Third, along these paths, resources have been left for us. And finally, we will meet others, starting in different places, but walking in the same direction. This presentation illustrates that. Others have adapted their routines and joined us, offering their talents to stop the unfairness. Matt Thomas at Florida University, Bart Kavula at Scholars Portal, and at a quack at New College at the University of Toronto. And from around the world, others are joining our network, and you can too. We've also found examples of libraries doing something similar, as these images show. McMaster University, Osgoode Hall Law School, and the University of Manitoba have integrated a request accessible copy link into their library platforms. If you know of more, please tell us. But adding a request an accessible copy link into a discovery layer or library platform risks being a band-aid to a deeper wound that the legacy of inaccessible journal publishing, procurement, and discovery has created. There are three main features of our PDF pit stop setup. One, verification. It's crucial to verify the quality of PDF documents before they're provided to a blind patron. Verification of the quality of these documents is done for sighted users by almost the entire publishing and provision process, but we know that there are common and often insurmountable barriers for blind users in these documents, like the ones mentioned by Ashley earlier, that need to be uh, at least identified, if not resolved. Uh, number two, no extra work for users. Blind patrons off, uh, already face multiple barriers and therefore extra work when finding, collecting, reading, and organizing their research material. A key goal of our PDF pit stop is to remove as much additional work on their part as we can. And number three, notifying people. It's important to ensure that not only is this work done, but that more than just the people directly involved are informed about the issues and the resolutions. For example, if Laurier is encountering a problem with inaccessible content in one of our resources, other institutions in Oakville who also have that resource should be notified. Their patrons are almost all certainly going to encounter the same problem as ours have. Or if there's work being done supporting a blind student in a certain subject area, the subject or liaison librarian should know so that they can provide additional assistance if necessary. And since we're usually paying for this content, those in acquisitions in the library should know that this work is having to be done on top of what we're paying. It's an additional cost that should be considered. In addition to managing the workflows associated with remediation requests, a large part and perhaps the biggest bottleneck of the pit stop is file format authoring. This means transforming PDFs into other formats based on a patron's needs. In many cases, a properly tagged PDF document is sufficient, but unfortunately, the vast majority of PDFs are not tagged. PDF is a visual format created for print media, and so it can be difficult to offer the level of accessibility provided by a WCAG conforming web document. This is why HTML and EPUB are rapidly emerging as the de facto accessible formats. Markup tags like headings, lists, tables, and landmarks were specifically designed with assistive technology in mind, and there's a greater level of certainty that what's shown on the screen is what will be read by a screen reader. On this slide is an image of an article in HTML 
with clearly defined headings, which someone using assistive technology can use to quickly navigate or jump through the document without having to use any extra effort to figure out what's being read. For fully sighted readers, visual cues or design patterns are what give text structure as shown by the image of the PDF on the left. But without proper tagging, the same text is experienced like the solid block of text on the right. Sadly, this is the default experience of almost all PDF-based library materials by people using screen readers, and thus creates a lot of unnecessary cognitive load not experienced by fully sighted users. Based on our own work thus far, the only way to properly tag a PDF document is to do it manually. And given the amount of content being published, it's easy to see why most publishers are referring people to HTML as the accessible copy. The graph on this slide shows the percentage of full text HTML available for all Elsevier content in Scholars Portal journals. It was below 10% in 2006 and jumped to about 80% by 2008. Today, it's about 95%. Nevertheless, only 20% of our total collections in Scholars Portal journals has full text HTML and reflects the larger publishing landscape, hence the need for a PDF remediation plan. Also, publisher provided HTML and EPUB are not necessarily accessible. There are often issues with missing alt text for figures and missing page numbers, but correcting those are a lot easier than modifying a PDF, and having an HTML version gets us almost to the finish line. But what do we do when the untagged PDF file is all we have? If a vendor can't provide an alternate format in a timely manner, we need to either tag the existing PDF using Adobe Acrobat Pro, or in cases where PDF tagging doesn't meet a person's needs, rebuild the whole document from scratch. We're still figuring out the best way to do this, and we've evaluated quite a few authoring tools in the process. At the moment, we've mostly settled on Microsoft Word as our primary authoring environment, it offers the most features for creating an accessible document that can be exported and converted into formats like HTML, EPUB, or DAISY. The DAISY Consortium, <clears throat> who officially maintains the DAISY standard, also maintains a variety of tools for authoring both DAISY files and EPUBs directly in Word. The image on the left shows the Word to EPUB extension inside of Word, while the image on the right shows the Save as DAISY extension. Once a Word document is exported to either format, it can be converted to other accessible formats, such as a Braille-ready file through the DAISY pipeline tool. So to summarize, we're traveling down well-worn paths, but we still need time, we need to fine tune our methods and workflows to make this part of the pit stop as fast as possible. As previously mentioned, it's important to include those responsible for acquisitions and collections somewhere in this process. Not only is it important for us to recognize that the work that must be done to make acquired material accessible to our patrons is an ongoing additional cost of those materials, but if these issues are never shared with those negotiating and deciding on products, new or renewing, they can't be considered in that process, and it may be difficult to ever see any improvement. Although more information is usually better, it's not necessary for every little detail to be shared. Uh, decision makers need to know the overall nature and scope of the problem and the solution. For example, what kinds of accessibility issues are appearing most often and how are they being resolved or avoided? Uh, what resources or platforms are being affected the most and therefore for which deals are we paying good money only to have to fix before handing over to some of our most already overburdened patrons? And this data is good, but minds aren't changed by numbers and lists alone, but through stories. So some understanding of the specific issues that blind patrons face if, or rather when, this work isn't done. Issues like the ones that Ashley shared with us earlier. This is important at the local institution level, but could even be more powerful and impactful if shared between institutions, so that we can all include these concerns in our negotiations and decision making. And compiled and used in broader consortial negotiations where more people and more money is on the line. In addition to reporting to acquisitions librarians, we also need to make sure librarians and library staff who are on the front lines and engaging with our end users are aware of the issues some of our patrons experience when accessing library materials. Part of the PDF Pit Stop mission is to build a community to help tackle the issue of accessibility barriers in academia. We want to connect with and bring together subject librarians from all dis disciplines to create a network of communication. 
We want to notify librarians in this network each time a journal article from their subject area arrives in the pit stop. The idea of this notification is to continually bring awareness to the issue so that it does not fall into the back burner, but is instead front and center in how we approach our work. From our perspective, the more people who are aware of the accessibility issues with our materials, the more chance that libraries will be able to catch these accessibility issues before they reach our end users. We want to minimize and eventually eradicate situations like the one Ashley described, where our blind patrons have to spend their valuable time locating accessible copies of journal articles. To do this, we need to work together to bring an end to the barriers of experienced by our users. In addition to notifications, we are also meeting with subject librarians. At this time, we have met with a group of three Canadian liaison librarians and informed them of the work we are doing because we received a number of requests from their subject areas. Awareness is one step, but we also want to expand our team to have more people available to help. We hope to add more members to our pit crew to be available to test, review, remediate, spread awareness, or to assist in other capacities as needed. If you want to get involved with our pit crew or stay connected with updates about the PDF pit stop, please fill out this form and select how you are able to participate. The link is bit.ly slash PDF dash pit stop dash network. A PDF pit stop is the partner to the board accessible movement. It recognizes the inevitable need for document remediation to address the legacy of born inaccessible journal articles. Libraries don't give damaged books and articles to sighted patrons. By the same token, patrons who are blind deserve and should expect the same level of quality that their sighted peers receive. I have a message for librarians. Accessibility is part of everyone's job. If you do not have a disability right now, if the word accessibility isn't in your job title, you are still urged to join the movement toward making information truly accessible to everyone. Each of you has some degree of influence, skill, and resource you can bring to the table, so consider this a call to action. I also have a message for blind listeners. The library is a place for you. Whether you are a student, community member, researcher, or scholar, you have the same right to access librarians, library resources, and library materials that your sighted peers do. You may access all of these things in different ways from the typical, but curiosity and innovation are highly valuable skill sets that I encourage all of us to embrace. In this era of increasing universal design, I encourage us to make a home for ourselves in any and all libraries. Thank you so much for attending our presentation. Okay, do we have any questions? Um, someone is asking, can you please show the link to the network again? Yeah, we can do that. Uh, is there a way that we can put it into the chat? Um, I'll see if I can. If you can send it to Joelle, then the organizers will put it in the chat. Okay. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. And it's great seeing how that resonates with our keynote speaker's speech earlier. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, so thank you again. And one more oh, one more. Wow. Okay. What can large content vendors such as Abesco do to help this? Mm. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, I think a priority is to really listen deeply to end users. Um, you have to believe. Uh, one of the things that we've learned in this process is to some extent blind screen reader users have given up on libraries. Uh, we don't listen well and we think we understand what's going on. And the more we work from that position, the less credibility we have. So I think uh, that's a key important step. I don't know, Ashley, if you want to comment. I think the only thing I would add to that, Mark, is 
take users seriously when we tell you that something isn't accessible. We, we know when things are and aren't accessible, and we have so many configurations and variables to consider that we have a high degree of expertise in our own situation. And I've had a number of kind of, you know, low scale arguments with vendors who insist that an item is, is accessible when it when it doesn't meet basic accessibility criteria. So really just try to familiarize yourselves with what kind of the very the very basic standards for accessibility are depending on the content mm -hmm. you're producing. Yeah, and if I could add one thing to that, just because something is WCAG compliant does not mean there, there, it is free from disadvantage. Content can have disadvantages and still meet web content, and we as librarians are called to respond to the disadvantage. So a very good example of this is page numbers. It's very difficult to get page numbers, very difficult, maybe even impossible to get page numbers uh, from journal articles with a screen reader just because of the way things are structured. Mm. That's not in WCAG. Webcon accessibility got it, but that is a very significant disadvantage, and so we have to respond beyond those the, a narrow interpretation of the guidelines. So that's what I would encourage uh, vendors to do. Exactly. If I may also add um, that vendors work closely with publishers to ensure that the content they're receiving is also accessible, so that our patrons and the end users are not stuck having to experience these barriers and then request remediation. There's lots that we can do. Um, before this content gets shared with our end users to make it accessible. And so if vendors have a chance to work with publishers to go through and make sure that these um, materials are accessible before they're shared with libraries, and that makes it a, uh, a communal work that we're doing to improve this environment as opposed to all the work being on um, certain groups. Right, there is no access without accessibility. Thank you so much for that significant presentation and for this call to action with making things more accessible for everyone using libraries. Moving on to, oh yes, and please give our presenters another big round of applause for their awesome work. Okay, and we are moving on to our lightning talks now. And the first presentation is converting archival description data to RICO. Hello, Access 2022. Our presentation provides a brief overview of our group's research into and experimentation with converting archival description data to records and context. Records in Context, or RIC, is a conceptual model for describing archival records, related agents, and activities with semantic triples. It is being developed by the International Council on Archives and is currently in draft format. Why are we interested in RIC and who are we? We are an informal international group of archivists and librarians who work with archival data or systems that provide access to archival data, such as archive space or access to memory or atom. Because of time limits, I won't name each of us, but our background is that we began working together as a group during the IMLS-funded Lighting the Way project on archival discovery. Our group was interested in how linked data could enhance discovery of our collections with a focus on Wikidata. Our collaborative and hands-on research discussions were helpful in talking through linked data issues that we all shared, so we continued to meet after Lighting the Way ended. Our research focus turned to exploring other archival description linked data opportunities, starting with what a potential transition to RIC might look like. Our initial questions were, what does RIC offer? How can we make the transition to RIC? Is this transition accessible to any type of archival institution, or is it limited to archives with specific levels of funding, training, and resources? Any transition to a new standard will require planning, estimations of labor, resourcing, and ideally, practical implementation pathways where the benefits justify the costs. So we started to get to know RIC. With 106 classes and over 238 core properties, we realized our understanding of it would best be informed by looking at our actual archival description data in RIC RDF format. We were grateful to find that the National Archives of France has a public script that can help with conversion. It converts EAD 2002 XML files to RIC RDF. The script offered us a consistent way to convert each of our own data to RIC. We produced a sample set of records from each institution. Three of us use archive space, one uses Atom, and one uses a homegrown system with EAD records encoded by hand. That gave us a wide variety of examples to compare the script's output. Here are some snippets of what our converted files look like and our first impressions of our data as RIC RDF. First, because the script was developed for the National Archives of France, the script tends to make assumptions. For example, it applied a local language declaration, assumed to be French, across each sample record. 
And then for some of us, the script resulted in missing provenance information. Well, for others, it did pick up provenance, but all of our source files were EAD 2002 XML, so we found this strange at first glance. While these first two issues that we noticed could be resolved by diving into the conversion script's code, we were most surprised to notice that the script assumes much of the source data is a literal or text base. You can see this in conditions of access, scope and content, and the arrangement note. This makes sense, of course, since these and many other archival description fields tend to be big blocks of text, but it was striking to us to view how much of the RDF conversion process resulted in data that didn't look much different than what we have in our original systems or the original EAD XML files. We didn't see how this initial conversion process enhanced our data. Also, very few of our sample EAD XML records contained URIs for entities, but where these did exist, the script did capture them, for example, in geographic and agent subjects. We suspect most archival institutions will not have many URIs for entities in their descriptions. This limits what can be done in a conversion to RDF. It results in a text-heavy rather than an interlinked output. Our observations so far may not surprise many access attendees. First, conversion scripts are not a magic solution. As we saw, much of our archival description does not translate to meaningful RDF. Any conversion from EAD XML or other description formats to meaningful RIC RDF will require script retooling or significant human intervention. Instead of a full-scale conversion, perhaps steps can be taken to enrich our current data first. This might include adding more identifiers to our data or uniquely classifying entities or events to break them out of long text fields. Finally, and we can't emphasize this enough, our experiments with converting our data to RIC showed that each of our institutions' output varied, even though we use the same input format and same conversion script. The relative openness of archival standards means that interlinking data across archives, whether it be in EAD, XML, RDF, or something else, will continue to be a challenge. Standards are wonderful, but shared practices are what make the standards actually work. Today's presentation only represents the beginning of our research. One of the next things we want to think about are use cases for RDF-based archival description data, and what simple actions we can take now so that our description data is prepared for future linked data standards and tools. We continue to think about labor in all of this as well. Any adoption of a new standard requires years of work. We expect that any transition of moving archival description data to an RDF or semantic triples format will require resources dedicated to building new systems, scripts, and tools, but also the social communities and working groups that support and encourage widespread adoption to create standardized data. We will put up a link to our slides and all of our RIC outputs can be found on GitHub. Please feel free to get in contact with us if you have thoughts or questions. Thanks for your attention. Take care. Questions for our presenters? <coughs> awesome. Well, in that case, let's move on to our next. Thank you so much for coming and presenting to us. That's great. And our next presentation is Time to Chain Together for the Future, uh, proposing to build the Canadian Cross Library Consortium Blockchain, which is by Wendy Shan from the University of Alberta, who is right here. Thank you, everyone. Um, should I read format? Okay, <laughs> the presentation is here. So uh, again, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for accepting me here. And uh, let's see how I'm Wendy Shen, and uh, I'm a programmer at the uh, University of Alberta uh, Library uh, for the DMP Assistant application. But today, it's not about DMP. <laughs> So my story starts on the weekend afternoon while I was just cleaning my apartment floor and listening to a podcast talk about a museum actually preserve a NFT object. I was very excited so I, because I think my library might get similar requests like this in the future. So I opened the museum link and I saw this. It's neat, right? It's very neat. So I kind of out of curiosity began to uh, Google this NFT and I clicked the first Google link that I had and it like this. So I, this is OpenSea.io by the way and I play on the second link for a while because it had so many actually fun information 
like the price of the NFT, who used to know it, what are the related AF NFTs, kind of like this. And then once I played for a while, I was hit by a question. Okay, so in the future, if the commercial websites doing a better experience in building than my library about presenting the NFT, what's the role my, of my library going to be? So I began to brainstorm this idea, and uh, during my research, I passed through the Crunchbase, and I saw just in the first half of 2022, there are around thousands or ten thousands of new startups already began to jump into blockchain, metaverse, Web 3.0 field. Um, I even not to mention established companies. So okay, if all of these companies are jumping and take care of the user experience, what library could do in the future? And I think I have an answer. In the future, library could rebrand as the knowledge master in the meta universe. And in order for us to do that, there are three hard and easy steps. Everything will be three steps. So first of all, we built functional based on ch functional based chain based on our team's need. So this is the step that each of the team go to discover their own requirements, begin to talk, begin to debate, and begin to make mistakes, and create pilot applications. So for example, for the asset management team, they could try to build a chain for ebook transfer only. So for all, all the transactions, it will be recorded into the blockchain and have a consensus that if any of the ebook actually reaching the maximum borrow status, we send a signal that this ebook is unavailable, and we can detect if any of the stakeholders, public, public, public chains, like publishers, borrowers, us, libraries, who validate this role. Because blockchain is literally one way of truth. It's totally transparent, it's trustless, all the stakeholders into this process have to agree with the result we see, and thus we avoid copyright disputes. So after this first step, it's time to chain together. We will get the opportunity to chain together, and if you see the slide uh, looks a little bit awkward, I will just express my meaning of it. So in this step, we not only connect inside of our department, so department and chain connect together, but it's a time for us to connect outside of the chains, like publisher chains, like NFT market chains. So in this step, we aim to build a solid cornerstone, tech cornerstone, for us to develop the user experience in the last step. So in this step, we connect each other, we test the full backend. And the last step is, since we get a very good tech base, we can actually move to think about what we're going to do in the metaverse. So our goal in this step is combine what we have before with all of the you know, advanced technologies like AR, VR, uh, artificial intelligence, all of this to focus on build a consistent but personalized experiences. So our goal is to make sure that for anyone or any of the organizations, they come to the library, they come to Canadian library, and they will fully trust us because we not only just give them information, we will give them the knowledge. We will be the master of all the knowledges for anyone who just, you know, virtually traveling, traveling around in the metaverse or physically going for us for help. All right, I know this sounds like really, we can, can we really do that? But you know, dreams doesn't come to <laughs> come to itself naturally. So I'm here to call for the actions. So now I suggest that for all the teams, we come back and we begin to discuss this idea with our teammates. We start the talk, we start to build pilot applications. And meanwhile, I will organize follow-up podcast meetups, community spaces for us to gather the ideas and feedbacks and see how each other are doing. So I totally believe that if we all work together from now, in the future, we will be able to reshape the Canadian libraries to a new level in the web age of 3.0. So thank you all for accepting me for any questions. Or if you want to connect with me, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much for that awesome presentation. If you want to
And I think that we've all heard a lot of the buzzwords around NFTs and blockchain over the years. So it's great to hear a proposal of how that connects to libraries. Okay. So if there are no further questions, we are going to move on to our next lightning talk, which is pre-recorded. And it is called the metagame, the librarianship expansion. The only way to lose is not to play. And this is being delivered by Mita Williams, who joined the University of Windsor in 1999 as a science librarian. Since that time, she has taken on a variety of roles at the Letty Library. She's currently the acting law librarian at the University of Windsor. So please give her a hand. And here we go. Hello and welcome to the metagame of the library land expansion, where the only way to lose is not to play. My name is Mita Williams. I'm the acting law librarian at Windsor Law at the University of Windsor. I have a personal motto, and that is changing the rules so more can win. I recently spent a year sabbatical year, one that ended June 30th, um, and I spent that year reading and writing about games and play. And it was a wonderful experience. I was able to read widely. Um, I was able to uh, spend some time trying to uh, capture some of the stuff that I've learned. Uh, I have an article coming out recent, uh, then very shortly. Uh, in the Playful Library issue of the Journal of Play and Adulthood. And uh, if you are interested in learning more specifically about play in academia, uh, I recommend the Playful Academic Special Issue and Designs for Playful Learning. Uh, it's something that I uh, would love to introduce more people to. It's uh, as a new way of, of, of kind of considering the systems that we work in. When I was on my sabbatical, I did design some games as well. For example, one of the games that I designed was called We Stayed Up All Night, My Friends and I. It is a uh, playable bibliography or a otherwise known as a choose your own manifesto game. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a game that's run. Uh, this game you can play in your browser and it's run uh, using the Twine game engine, um, but a lot of the games that I've made actually are card games or uh, puzzle games that can only be played uh, in a specific place. Now there are a number of different reasons why I spent my year uh, learning and thinking about games in a context of libraries, and there are several reasons why I did so, but I will leave you with this one grand idea uh, that designing games is one way to better understand how systems behave. Indeed, one way that we can consider tabletop games um, is not dissimilar to paper computers. Uh, they are designed, they enact systems of rules and procedures, and if those rules and procedures are changed or reordered, they can have sometimes very different outcomes uh, in both the end of play or in the experience of those players who are playing the game. One of the things that I learned from that year was that game design is hard. Um, and one of the lessons that I would like to embark or share with you uh, in part, not embark, in part with you, is that game modification is easier. And in fact, we should feel more, um, more able to modify games. We should feel more liberated to do so. Because unlike so many other cultural artifacts, games themselves, the game mechanics, are, are considered systems and are therefore uncopyrightable. The artwork surrounding a particular game can be copywritten. The text 
the branding can be copywritten. But game mechanics themselves are uncopyrightable and therefore they can be reused and they can be um, rethought of and remixed and reimagined in all sorts of wonderful ways. So one of the game modifications that I did over the course of my sabbatical was called the metagame. And the metagame was a game from uh, several years now. Uh, it is it was created by a trio of, of game designers. Uh, I believe it was specific first designed either for a, a magazine and then used at a games conference so it was like sort of a massively multiplayered a conversation game um, and that's what this is largely is it's a, it's a conversation game where uh, you share opinions about various cultural artifacts it has uh, the game is actually two comprised of two decks um, one of them is a deck of culture cards of civilization's greatest achievements and a second set of cards of opinion cards. Um, and in the various versions of this game, you play one of these against the other and you uh, judge and argue your case. Now, some of you might be thinking, wow, that sounds a lot like Cards Against, Human cards against Humanity. And, or uh, the deeper cut, uh, Cards Against Librarianship. And indeed, that question has been raised to the designers of the metagame. And in fact, the metagame came first. Uh, Cards Against Humanity cited the metagame as one of their game influences. Um, I will just probably just state on the uh, onset that my particular version of the metagame uh, with library theme one is absolutely uh, unabashedly sincere and wholesome and very much interested in uh, just getting more information and 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 uh, opinions uh, of our colleagues and our friends about very aspects of library land. Um, and I did this by reaching out to friends and said, hey, I'm making a library game. Um, I came up with some ideas uh, that could be cards in such a game of librarianship. And I asked them, I said, what am I missing? And uh, that was my starting of my list. And then people uh, gave me some great suggestions to uh, complete that list. Um, and as we know, the, the best thing to do with problems is to put them in a spreadsheet. And I did that. So you can see here, this is the makings of the list of culture cards. Um, I took uh, each of these sort of major ideas and I went to the noun project where I could find um, Creative Commons licensed uh, icons that I could use and apply them against each of these terms. And then what I did was I made use of uh, free to use software called Nandek. I heard about Nandek by listening to a game design podcast in which the designer of Wingspan uh, told uh, the audience that she used Nandek extensively in her development and of Wingspan and because it you can you can quickly and easily uh, make and reiterate and design uh, cards and so the the code that you see in front of you is the code that um, I use to make my uh, version of the library land metagame and in fact just yesterday I received the output of those cards. Um, I generated the cards. I sent them off to uh, a company called The Game Crafter. Um, there's a very nice tight integration between Nandek and that particular company. And they were able to uh, print out and make available uh, these two decks. And uh, they, if you are interested, uh, you can buy your own uh, for the low, low price of uh, $30 and 74 cents uh, USD. Um, alternatively, I have made uh, this, this same set of cards available as PDFs. Um, I will provide the link elsewhere um, in, a, uh, in, a, in an addendum bibliography uh, where you can download the two sets of cards, uh, print them out on two different colored pieces of paper, um, and play with your friends uh, and your library staff room 
um, or uh, play at the library conference. I mean, one of the things that I was very much hoping to do was to take this deck of cards and bring it to access so that I could play it uh, with you all there. But unfortunately, uh, that was not possible this year. Uh, maybe at the next access conference. And to leave, uh, I just want to leave this quote. Uh, I think of uh, the work of, uh, of Bernie de Coven uh, quite a bit. Uh, he is a sort of scholar of play. And he says that in a game community, the rules and officials decide uh, if the players are good enough to play. If not, they change the players. But in a play community, the players decide if the game is fun enough to play. And if not, they change rules. And I've always thought of the good of the community of access um, as a play community. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Bye. Awesome. Are there any questions for Mita? I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm super psyched to actually go and print this off after the conference and then corner all my colleagues at the library and, you know, encourage them to help out. And you can see those beautiful cards in the background. So not seeing any questions coming in, but thank you so much. And as an avid tabletop player, yeah, I am going and getting the printer out. This is going to happen. Lunchroom. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And all right, it's break time. There should be food next door, apparently. Or so I am told.
So which which other things do you have?
Okay, hello everyone. We're in the, the home stretch of the day. Uh, thank you so much for, for staying around, those of you who I can see and those of you who I can't see. Um, we have three more presentations this afternoon. Uh, first up is a remote presentation, remote but live, not pre-recorded. So this will be exciting. This is the first time today that we're having a live remote presentation. Uh, so the presentation is called Community Initiated Connectivity Joint Venture Opens the Door to Economic Reconciliation on BC's Coast, uh, presented by Ben Hyman and Rene Labouquin. Rene Labouquin is the Manager of Strategic Initiatives with the Strathcona Regional District based in Campbell River, BC on Vancouver Island. Having lived in rural communities in northern BC and Alberta, Renee understands the digital inequities rural Canadians continue to experience. Previously, she worked to support the delivery of post-secondary and adult education programs in rural communities. Connectivity and technological literacy were significant barriers to remote learning. Renee assists the Connected Coast project with communication, engagement, and partnership development. She's excited to see how rural and remote communities will embrace improved connectivity on BC's coast. And Ben Hyman is the Executive Director of Vancouver Island Regional Library. He was previously the University Librarian at Vancouver Island University, the Founding Director of BC Libraries Cooperative, and a Director with the Government of BC. For 25 years, he's been working with and around bad connectivity on, on, on uh, Canada's West Coast. So welcome to Ben and Renee. Thanks, everybody, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, we didn't realize we were coming right after the snacks, so uh, we'll step it up, try to keep the tempo going. Uh, Ike Squail, Entaba Ben Hyman, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm really privileged and grateful to be joining you today from ancestral and unceded Snanamuk territory here on Vancouver Island. Uh, really sorry I can't be there in Ottawa today. I've been attending access conferences since about 2003 and uh, always get so much out of them, especially in real life. But uh, my thanks to the conference organizers for again organizing hybrid goodness and for all the support. I'm really grateful that my colleague Renee is joining me today. Do you want to just say a quick hello, Renee? Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for having us uh, share some information about the Connected Coast Project. I would like to acknowledge uh, that I'm joining you today from the unceded traditional territory of the Lakwatak speaking uh, people and honored to be doing so. Awesome. Back thanks, over Renee. to you. Thank you. And thanks to the reviewers who took time to consider our, uh, our uh, presentation proposal and offered really helpful uh, questions and suggestions. Um, I'm going to deal with the context up front and leave all the good bits and awesome bits for Renee in the back. So uh, that's uh, this is what the shape of the presentation will do. We're already done with the first bit, and now we'll just get straight into it. So in 2016, many of you may remember the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission, or CRTC, declared finally broadband as a uh, broadband internet as a basic telecommunications service. It took them many decades to get there. CRTC ordered that internet service providers do a better job 
And they set a minimum threshold for broadband speeds of at least 50 megabits per second down and 10 megabits per second up by the end of 2021. So I checked in this morning, according to CRT's website, six years after their order uh, and a year after their deadline, while 89.5% of Canadians have that 5010 service available, only 53% of rural communities do. Uh, the digital divide is alive and well in Canada. So in context of truth and reconciliation, I'm going to speak some truth. First, connectivity public policy in Canada has been a complete disaster when measured from the perspective of rural, remote, and especially First Nations communities. Uh, suffice it to say that, um, and I'll say this quickly in case anyone holds it against me, providers like TELUS and Bell are certainly accountable, but so too are the extraordinarily poor coordination between various levels of government, uh, the lack of creativity and care taken to the connectivity file in the first place, and incredibly insufficient benchmarking and enforcement over time. In addition, uh, and we can tell many stories about this, I'm sure, major internet service providers have and continue to significantly overrepresent their service offerings while simultaneously and deliberately acting to frustrate community-led connectivity initiatives. I despair. The truth is that rural, coastal, and northern First Nations communities have been disproportionately impacted by Canada's public policy connectivity failure. Uh, truth is also that public, post-secondary, and government libraries on this coast for certain have and continue to underserve or unserve rural First Nations communities. And the last truth I'll say is our provincial and national associations in the library sector have not been strong enough advocates or allies on this file. So this is a map of Vancouver Island Regional Library service area. Uh, we serve about a half a million people across 42,000 square kilometers from Haida territory in the north to Souk territory in the south and the traditional territories of the, of the Nichelneth on the west coast, uh, all the way on the east to the territories of the New Hulk near Balakula. All of the orange dots you see, I don't know if that's coming through, the orange dots are our 39 public library branch locations. And all the other dots are First Nations population centers, according to BC stats. So I know that we at VIRL have much work to do as we continue to walk in two worlds as an 86 year old settler organization serving and living on the territories of 53 first nations what jumps out at me with this map is that more than 139 communities in this region still do not have fiber connectivity or anything near 50 down and 10 up but the really exciting thing and why why we're here is because they soon will through Connected Coast. And it's really a very powerful game changer and a paradigm shift, not just for libraries like VRL, but for all libraries serving populations on the West Coast, or indeed, uh, if you're post-secondary like Carleton, uh, and you have students that come from the West Coast, this matters to you in terms of service delivery, access to content and services. I hope our presentation today may uh, pique your curiosity and inspire you to lead from wherever you are to help put pressure on until everyone who wants it has 50 down and 10 up or better in every corner of this country and with renewed urgency. Hey, Sapka, I'm going to pass it to Renee for the good bits now. All right, thank you, Ben. The Connected Coast project is a subsea fiber optic network which will bring high speed connectivity to over 139 underserved First Nation and rural remote communities on BC's coast. The 3,400 kilometer uh, network will stretch from north uh, in the Prince Rupert area across to Haida Gwaii and south to Vancouver and around Vancouver Island. 
it will allow more than 175,000 British Columbians to access high-speed internet. Okay, next slide. The Connected Coast project is a backbone uh, project and doesn't include last mile infrastructure. Once the technology reaches the shore, as illustrated in the diagram, uh, internet service providers will be able to connect to the technology and then provide high-speed services to their customers. Next slide. So I would like to uh, spend some time and, and explain how a regional, small regional local government uh, got into the business of the telecommunications industry. Uh, it's been a priority of our board for several years to improve connectivity. And uh, as Ben had alluded to throughout our region, um, our member municipalities uh, and uh, residents in the area have significantly lower than the standard 5010 uh, service. And this continues to be a challenge today. Um, many residents have less than 10 megabytes down and two megabytes upload unacceptable to, um, to be able to function online today. The regional uh, district had been advocating to large internet service providers and senior governments for more than a decade to improve these service uh, levels. And many other regional districts on the island were also experiencing similar challenges. The SRD um, back in 2017 completed some completed research, developed a broadband study and uh, built a business case. This business case included the concept of a subsea network around Vancouver Island. In the north, uh, City West, which is a medium-sized internet service provider and a subsidiary of the city of Prince Rupert, was also looking to do the same. They wanted to improve the redundancy of their network through a subsea cable to connect uh, to Vancouver at the uh, Vancouver Internet Exchange. Both uh, organizations submitted funding applications to provincial and federal programs. Uh, they did this independently, and then the funders approached both parties and encouraged them to work together to create one network. So this resulted in a joint venture partnership between the Strathcona Regional District and City West for a $47 million uh, project. Uh, the ability of the two organizations to collaborate and to build on their own expertise in business networks has been key to the success of the project so far. Funding for the Connected Coast uh, Network has come from three different federal and provincial programs uh, listed uh, there on the, on the right. Next slide, please. <clears throat> A core value of this joint venture and the project has been partnerships. Uh, this approach has expanded the network uh, beyond the 139 um, sites uh, for community, rural and remote communities uh, to include a partnership with the Canadian Coast Guard. Um, this arrangement has increased the number of sites on the network to include additional lighthouse and search and rescue stations. Uh, so this will really improve uh, safety and the Canadian Coast Guard's ability to uh, respond um, and also be able to recruit um, staff to work at those rural and remote uh, locations. Uh, another partnership has been with the Natural Resource Canada and they have added their early earthquake uh, warning system to the network. So um, we have partnered and are in discussions with several small internet service providers and internet societies to improve service for their clients. Most importantly, I uh, wanted to highlight the um, work that the project partners are doing to advance opportunities for reconciliation. The network will bring digital equity to many coastal First Nations. Uh, City West is also partnering with several communities on last mile infrastructure projects. During the construction, the project procurement uh, has also included opportunities for First Nations. Next slide. Uh, just quickly, the key accomplishments so far, we're a third uh, complete the project and we have over a thousand kilometers laid uh, between north of Prince Rupert down to Cabell River and just last week we finished the Vancouver to the island uh, section. Uh, next slide. 
The uh, Gitgat First Nation is one of our partners and they've been hired to use uh, some of their watercraft. Uh, they reconfigured a fishing vessel to do the work. And I'd like to share a short video here where one of their band members, uh, Theodore Clifton, shares his perspective. He's very proud that he, his dad and his brother are working on the project and um, really highlights uh, the difference improved connectivity uh, will have for their community. If we can play that, it's a short clip. My personal struggles with internet and weather has a lot to do with how good or how bad it is. Once it gets hardwired in, it's gonna make the biggest difference and bring us up to par and it's really not dependable at the moment, you know, as if you were in Prince Rupert or Vancouver. All right, so that was a really quick uh, highlight of the project, and I believe we have time to welcome any questions. Absolutely, thanks, Renee. Thanks for walking us through that. So, just got up on on screen here all the ways you can uh, keep watch on how this this project's proceeding, and by all means, reach out in the back channels if you have any questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Ben and Renee. What a great presentation. Um, it's always good to be reminded uh, of the digital divide. Uh, for those of us who spend a lot of time in urban centers, it's, it's easy to let it, it slip our minds. So thank you so much. Um, we, we have one question already. Um, speaking of digital divide, what was your reaction when Rogers Network crashed, causing a nationwide outage and the government's rapid rebuke of telecoms? Yeah, I, can, I can take that. <laughs> okay. Wasn't that hilarious and, uh, <laughs> and somewhat predictable? And, and even more so, the, the report and recommendations that came forward afterwards, which is that the telcos fundamentally need to do better to help each other out. Um, I've pondered a lot over the years how if Canada may have just started with a public first approach to all of this, we, we would have been so much further ahead. I mean, I don't want to negate the challenges, the enormity of the challenges. The video gives you a sense of just how ridiculous the work is to get fiber everywhere. And it's a big, expensive country to cover. But uh, I think we've seen clearly time after time after time over decades now that the telcos cannot be the folks that advance this. Uh, on behalf of all Canadians. And so uh, the Rogers outage really just punctuated that in several hilarious and very frustrating ways. Great, thank you. Um, another question, it may have been mentioned, but how come the minimum upload download rates are not enforceable? Or maybe what are the ways that they can be enforced? That's a great one. Renee, feel free to Oh, oh, man, if you have any ideas. <laughs> well, I was just going to say we did a, a lot of work last year uh, trying to dispute some of the figures that, um, say, the telecos have expressed that they are able to deliver, but customers are not experiencing those. So, um, there and there was a number of communities that, that did that as well. So, the BC government did do a short study on looking at those disparities and how they may be able to address address them um yeah i couldn't really explain how the government uh or why they're not enforcing that that 50 10 um, limit or threshold and you know this project we're we're aiming to get much greater than the minimum 50 10. uh customers will have much more than the 5010 uh, limit and in fact uh, as a result we'll have just the same um, service that you would in a in a major urban center and have up to a thousand uh, or one gigabyte of service uh, if that's what the customer would like great thank you i think we have one more question do we have time for one more sarah yeah awesome um, 
It's, it's an easy one. Very, very easy with this one. Uh, how do you go about procuring equipment, cabling, etc., when you're not an ISP with existing partnerships? Because you, and this is actually in the question, you can't just walk down to Best Buy. <laughs> That's right. So uh, as um, part of the project, we have project managers and City West is, uh, because they are in the business already, they're, they're an internet service provider. Um, well, sorry, that's more for last mile, but we, we do have Baylinks Network, who is our contractor for the, for the um, project, and they're very familiar and have done projects uh, elsewhere, and so they're the ones who are procuring the, uh, the technology and, uh, and the equipment needed for the project. Fantastic. Thank you. Best Buy not required. Awesome. No. Uh, thank you so much, Ben and Renee. Uh, lovely presentation. And you're remote, but we will give you a warm ha hand of applause. In the thank you. Thank you. So next up, we have an in-person presentation, uh, More Than a Migration, Moving a Library 3D Printing Service Online. Um, the presenters for this, uh, this session are Jenny Wu and Mike Spears from the University of Toronto. Uh, Carrie Tone is, uh, is a co-author but is, is choosing to be moral support uh, <laughs> at the table. Um, so please welcome Jenny and Mike. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny and I am a student staff at the Gerstein Science and Information Center. Um, and this is my colleague Mike. Mike is the manager of the Mobile Application Development Lab uh, located at Gerstein, which is a partnership between the libraries and the U of T Information Technology Services. Our colleague Carrie is also here with us today and all of us are very happy to be here today to talk about our remote 3D printing pro uh, project slash service at Gerstein Library. Um, so this is our agenda today. Uh, we will cover uh, an introduction to the service, including a bit about the history and the background. We will present the workflow of the service and the, work, uh, the, the service components. We will share our reflection, and in the end, we will do a live demo. Uh, so now let's get started. And Mike, would you like to introduce our service? Okay, thanks, Jenny. Um, so, uh, to give you some history, back actually way back in 2014 at Gerstein and Lab, we launched a brand new 3D printing uh, and training service at Gerstein Library. Uh, we made two MakerBot Replicator 2 printers available for students and faculty uh, to book for academic and personal projects. The service was designed to allow the students to print, uh, to, to completely control the 3D printing process. They could book a block of time uh, to print one or multiple projects, and they were entirely responsible for the outcome of their project. Uh, two, two staff members, including myself, uh, would be regularly available during those bookings to provide support. We designed a 50-minute uh, training session to support this service. It was delivered on a regular bi-weekly schedule uh, throughout the year with support from a Gerstein librarian and student library assistant. Students were required to take the in-person training before using the printers. A major focus of the in-person training was really a safe operation of the printer. Uh, between 2014 and 2020, we have trained over 2,000 students on our 3D printers uh, for our in-person 3D printing facility. Our training sessions were quite popular, uh, even just for students who, were, who wanted to learn the basics of 3D printing uh, out of curiosity. Um, and then following training, students would prepare their print jobs with the MakerBot print software, usually at home in advance, uh, and then print on our MakerBot Replicator 2 printers in our facility. So uh, campus lockdowns forced us to cancel in-person workshops and services. Um, the entire library was closed to students for periods of time. Uh, and construction projects within the building extended the time that the lab was not accessible. The way our service was delivered, we found that staff presence for, and support during the printer bookings was usually needed to keep things kind of running smoothly, uh, even though the students were responsible ultimately for their own print jobs. So this meant it was difficult to move the service to open areas of the building since staff, we would like to have staff nearby uh, during those bookings. So next slide. 
Thanks. Um, so uh, during this time, uh, especially in the early pandemic, I was able to take on print jobs on behalf of certain clients uh, for urgent or academic projects like printing PPE uh, or other supplies for research. Sometimes I would be printing from home since I was to take a printer home with me. Um, this was like almost like a rehearsal for offering a full remote service. I was able to learn about the workload and challenges of printing objects to our clients' expectations. So our goals for the new service were to address the problem of availability. Uh, we took the opportunity to also deepen and extend our training at the same time. It was important in taking on more responsibility for the actual printed output to promote an understanding of how 3D printing works and des how designs and what designs are likely to be successfully printed. Also, the original home for our online information, training and support materials was a LibGuide. We wanted to move training and support materials to a learning management system instead and allow the LibGuide to be more of a resource describing 3D printing services in general at U of T. Thank you, Mike. So as stated in the goal, um, our remote service allows the users to learn about 3D printing, to design and submit a print job from anywhere. And this is a workflow chart that describes the steps that the user needs to take to access and use our service. The first step they need to take is to complete an online training module and pass all the quiz in order to be certified. Once they're certified, they can work on either uh, downloading a model or designing a model that they wish to print. Uh, once they have the model, they import it to the MakerBoss print software to prepare it for printing. And they can customize the print with different options, such as adjust the infill and add a support or a raft to their model. Uh, they can also see a print preview in that software that includes an estimated print time. And when they're ready to submit, they simply fill out a form and upload their model to the MakerBot Cloud Print System. We will receive the request and process their printing in the lab. And once their print job is done, we will send, a, send out a new notification email so that they know that they can come to the library in person to pay and pay, pick up their print jobs. So in this presentation, we will focus on two of the uh, key service components, including the online learning module and the MakerBot Cloud Print platform, which we will demo at the end of our presentation. So what's included in our online learning tr module or training module? Uh, so here is the breakdown of the structure. Module one introduces the 3D printers, including what do we have at the lab for the remote service and in general, how do the 3D printers work? And module two talks about the 3D printing workflow, including the design principles, process, and the software that the, the user need to know to be able to design and submit a print job. And the third module, which is the last module, introduces the service policy, including who is eligible for the service and what's the cost and how to submit or pick up a, a, a print job. Um, so as the hands-on learning component of the in-person safety training is lost in our remote service, we decided to incorporate interactive learning elements, visuals and videos in our online modules. We also took this as an opportunity to expand and to include more educational content than what we could have provided in the 15 minute safety training. So, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, we created our online learning module on the platform called Articulate, which is a uh, web-based tool for crafting e-learning experiences. And with this tool, we were able to uh, make, make uh, interactive learning elements, such as for allowing the users to click around on an image of a printer and learn what each parts are. So the modules are containing diff uh, a numbers of different lessons, sorry. Uh, a number of different lessons. And at the, uh, at the end of each lesson, there is a knowledge chat point that summarizes key takeaways. Uh, that will help the user to do a mini review before they move on to the next lesson. And at the end of each module, there will be a quiz, uh, a multiple choice quiz that will help the users to review what they learned in the whole module. And then that will also make sure that they are ready to use our service. The quiz is not timed. The user can attempt unlimited times until they get 100% in order to move on. 
So we incorporated the module into the uh, Canvas, which is the learning management system we use at U of T. Canvas supports SCORM, so that lets us to uh, directly incorporate the articulate modules into our online lear learning management system. And this helps us to take care of the authentication and keep track of individual users' progress. We can also use this platform to reach out to all of the service users uh, regarding updates, make announcements, and share the resources. So, so far, since we launched our service in January 2022, we have got 155 users signed up for the online training, 73 got certified, and 49 print jobs are done. We are very happy with this as uh, a good start, and we are working on to promote this service more in the fall semester. And as a reflection, we summarize the challenges and the advantage of a remote service. The first challenge is definitely because the service really required a cross-department effort. For example, we uh, gained a lot of support from the circulation desk staff to manage our project, pre uh, the print job pickup process. And we also, like our colleague from the inf information technology services, they really helped us to install the MakerBot software on all of the student and staff workstations in our library, which was a great help. Um, the second challenge would be since this is a remote service, the human labor element of the service became very uh, less visible to our users. For example, it's, it, it's really hard for us to provide an uh, estimated turnaround time, as some of the users might be expecting. And uh, also, as a remote service, it could not provide a real hands-on experience for our users. Um, so that means they could not really see the object is printing or they cannot access the polishing tool at the lab uh, to polish their finished object. Um, well, on the other side, uh, the remote service is, is more equitable that all of the students from all three campuses of U of T, they can access the, e uh, the service and the online training modules easily. Um, the online training module is also more transferable for for sharing, for updating, and it's definitely easier for our users to review whenever they want to, compared to in the old format of an in-person safety training. Um, overall, our service, our remote service, is just more convenient for our users because they don't, they don't have to take the time to come in the lab to take the in-person training, and then they don't have to sit there in the lab waiting for the whole time while their object is printing. So yeah, so that's a, a reflection of the challenge and the advantage of our remote service. And now we will move on to a live demo. And uh, can we have our video plate, please? Oh, it's playing. Okay, sorry, it wasn't playing in the confidence. Uh, oh, oh, okay. okay. Oh. Uh, so what we see here is the MakerBot print software. This is what students might use at home or on a library computer to prepare their print job. So uh, the app lets them define every aspect of the print job, including the quality settings. Uh, the print preview screen shows an estimated printing time as well. Uh, that's very important because it lets students estimate the, to uh, the cost for their print job. And then before ex exporting, uh, their print job. We also ask them to take a screenshot of the final design and that will help me understand what they expect to print. So here they're exporting the uh, print file. So the print file is kind of like a, a package that really has all the instructions that are needed to, to actually prepare and print the object. So next we have a form uh, for their print submission. Um, there's a series of questions at the front. Uh, it sort of reiterates our kind of general and important recommendations uh, we make in our training. Um, we think of it as like a pre-flight checklist. Um, so they go through that. Hopefully they answer yes <laughs> to all the questions, although we can accommodate changes to that as well. Um, and then uh, they can choose what color they would like. We can change the colors on the form as we decide to add different colors to our system. And then uh, they can upload their screenshot. So one unfortunate thing is that Microsoft Forms doesn't let you upload arbitrary files of different data types. So we can't submit the print job directly through Microsoft Forms. But luckily, we got this Microsoft, or sorry, uh, MakerBot Cloud Print service included with our purchase of the MakerBot printers. Um, and 
this gives the students a guest link that they can use to upload their file into MakerBot Cloud, which is what I use to manage the print queue. And I cut out the I'm not a robot stuff because <laughs> I kept failing it. So, <laughs> so uh, once it's been submitted, uh, the student will wait until they get an email from me. The email will have an invoice for them. They go to the library front desk uh, and they pick up their print job and pay for it there. So finally, you're going to see my perspective uh, as the manager of the print queue. And this will show uh, incoming print jobs. I can review them. Um, I can see uh, you know, some details about the print job. And I can approve the print job and add it to the queue. So this would be a, a chance for me to just check for any potential issues, maybe reach out to the user. Um, I'll know to accept, uh, expect incoming print jobs because um, I'll receive a notification from Microsoft Forms that it's been, uh, that somebody has submitted something. And then I can also use this to kind of monitor actual print jobs and directly send the print job to the printer online uh, through the cloud. Um, so this really helps. This is, I find this really useful because it just, for me, as the person managing this and doing all sorts of other tasks in my day-to-day -day job, that I can, uh, I can sort of keep an eye on things. And I don't have to deal with files all the time and copying files between different devices. Um, it just is a click of the button. I can start a print job. Uh, so that concludes the demo. Yep. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jenny and Mike. Um, we'll give folks a chance to uh, put some questions into Slido, but uh, so don't go, don't go too far <laughs> in case people have questions for you. Um, Again, add Slido. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, oh, here we go. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the first question is a, starts with a URL, so I was a little confused about whether I was supposed to read the URL out loud. I am not going to read the URL out loud. But is uh, since you're here, you can see. Is that what you, your ditto cursor? Yeah. Can yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> You can also adjust the size of your cursor. So I accidentally made it really big and it become really cute. So I just kept it that way. <gasps> Is that the cute little animated? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing. OK. If Yes. Fabulous. Customcursor.com for that cute little cursor. Um, and the next question, would you ever go back to the full in-person service after this experience? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to go back to it. Uh, you know, and I, I think of this as, as an alternative. Um, one of the things that students would say would be like, I can't come during the week. I just have too many classes. So this is a way to help them out. But I just miss being able to talk to the students about their projects all the time. Um, and it was a way to kind of respond to their needs as well, just to be able to see what they're doing. Um, and I think we're going to continue that. We, we're starting the signups for our first back to campus kind of workshop for that. Uh, and it's already people are kind of lining up Right, so yeah, it's right. exciting. Yeah. So it's sort of a both and situation. I, I hopefully, yeah, hopefully we can maintain that level of service mm -hmm. for sure. Fantastic. Uh, do you make a profit from the printing costs, or does it just recover the material costs? I don't have a full accounting, but it's designed to cover the material costs. That's our goal. And there's also um, uh, repair costs and other kinds of consumables that go with it, apart from just the plastic. Also, yeah. are probably going to need to upgrade the old replicators pretty soon because they're getting creaky and the software isn't. Uh, you can't upload it to a new machine; it doesn't support on new iOS. So, right. so Carrie's chiming in that the uh, that they'll also have to upgrade the hardware, the the replicators, because uh, they're getting they're getting creaky. Uh, <laughs> so, um, as we all know, maintenance is uh, <laughs> is a big thing. Cur um, curiously, just to add to that, it's it's not the hardware, it's a, it's a physical thing we're doing, but really it's the software that's going out of date and being discontinued oh, okay, and stops okay, working okay. and stuff. So, right. Yeah. Creaky in the software sense, yeah. not creaky yeah. in the actual... Like, well, kind of both, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and another question, were commercial 3D printing companies considered as an alternative to do, doing the prints in-house? 
I'll take this one. No. Oh, <laughs> Carrie, I don't know if uh, can I come up to the here you can. <laughs> yeah, why don't okay, you sorry. just there? Hi, your mic. Oh my goodness, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Um, no, we think that 3D printing is like a learning opportunity for students. And so this was one of the challenges with this service is how do we ensure that students can still get their hands on it and learn about design um, and do it themselves the same way that we don't do people's research for them in the library. We expect them to learn how to do research themselves. It's the same approach. So thank you. That was, that, that was good. <laughs> um, and that looks like it's the end of the questions, and I think that's the end of our time. So a uh, warm round of applause for all of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're doing well. We're right on time. Um, so the last presentation of the first day of Access is uh, a remote presentation, a recorded presentation. Uh, called A Tale of Two Authentication Services by Catherine Larson. Catherine will be joining us for the Q&A, so she does have a live component. And I can see her from, you can't, she's in the back now if you want. <laughs> she won't see you, but anyway. Uh, so <laughs> I'm just, I'm excited to see people. Um, as the Assistant Director of Systems and Technology at the New York University Health Sciences Library, Catherine Larson leads the team that provides technical support of library systems. This includes the design and development of the NYU Health Sciences Library website, the Lillian and Clarence de la Chapelle Medical Archive site, the NYU HSL subject guides, the catalog, and other systems. She has also recently been spending more time than anticipated thinking about entitlements and access to resources. So welcome, Catherine, and we'll see your presentation right now. Welcome everyone, my name is Katherine Larson and I'm here to tell you a tale of two authentication services. A question I ask about our library and our systems team is what is our primary function? See, I see it as providing our patrons with access to their resources and if we fail at this, then we fail our patrons. In these next few slides, I'll cover how over the years our library has tackled similar but different issues around this particular pain point of user access. Using systems that live in an environment where the IT department isn't yours, where the authentication service isn't yours, it means hurdles to overcome. We have a broad constituency with different authentication services and different physical locations. However, we are in a consortium and historically have not had the necessary technology, time, or political sway to offer such fine-tuned personalization that all patrons should be able to have. The landscape of the New York University Health Sciences Library is that it serves the students, faculty, and staff of NYU Langone Health, the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and the NYU College of Dentistry. This is a diverse population and the library must provide support for holders of either net IDs or KIDs, which are also known as Kerberos IDs. The Health Sciences Library also shares software with our parent organization, NYU Libraries. This kind of makes maintenance and development a challenge as the NYU Health Sciences Library does not necessarily maintain those applications. And since our parent organization has their own constituency and their own plans beyond the Health Sciences Library's scope, this has implications for us when it comes to usability and resource management, just to name a few. I want to cover some definitions first to explain how I'm viewing the differences between these words. Authentication verifies who someone is. It is, you are who you say you are. Authorization is the process that verifies that someone has the right to access a resource, or you have the right to use this, or this is your role. Entitlement is how authorization is managed. If you have the required entitlement or attribute, then you're authorized to access a resource. So today, first, I'll share the impact to library patrons and staff of decisions that were made without the full consideration of the current identity authentication landscape and that it's had on our library patrons. Then I'll share what solutions the library has implemented to ease those access pain points. And finally, I want to stress the importance of patiently building relationships. Back in 2014, we began using our parent organization's OCLC's ILLiad application to handle our interlibrary loan requests. 
This offered the opportunity to improve the workflow for our staff and our patrons, but we quickly learned that we would not be able to offer immediate access to a number of our users due to the system being set up for only active NetID holders. Our patrons do have NetIDs, but not all are active, and certainly not all patrons are aware that they even have a NetID. The impact of this was that activation for KID holders required manual assistance. It was not known by either library at the time of setup that KID patrons or holders had no way to find out a specific identifier for activating their NetID without contacting the identity management team. They actually had to pick up a phone or, or send an email and they didn't know who to call, so it did not save anyone any time. For the immediate solution, our systems administrator working with IT was able to create a tool that allowed our KID patrons to find out the identifier on their own without need for that manual intervention, which was fabulous. I am so thankful for that. This helped not just library patrons, but all NYU Lancome Health users who had a use case for needing an active NetID. Here you can see the ILL user makes an ILL request. They're directed to activate their NetID, but includes a link to find out their required university ID. The user is then directed to activate their NetID, now with the knowledge of their university ID. Okay, it's not ideal, but it was a solution. Thankfully, by 2019, we were able to move our instance of Iliad to SAML Shibboleth by placing our easy proxy in between to allow the authentication of KID users into Iliad. So now they didn't even need to use their NetID. They could use what they're used to. The opportunity here is that the issue highlighted a gap in a use case that wasn't apparent to either institution, and the library was able to fill that gap thanks to our development team with connections to IT. Our library also shares a local instance of Ex Libris's Primo with our parent organization, and we use that as our catalog. Our parent organization used a separate capability to offer personalization options outside of Primo, but this required the use of, you guessed it, a NetID. This, as you know, excluded the majority of our patrons. Ex Libris released updates to their discovery layer which offered personalization that our library wanted to be able to offer and that patrons wanted, but due to the different authentication services of NetID versus KID, the login through our parent organization still only functioned with NetID users, or so that's what we were informed, and that this meant that we were unable to offer this new personalization to the majority of our users. So what did we do? We suppressed the personalization. The impact was that if they were looking, patrons could see that other libraries were receiving this type of personalization and possibly wonder why they didn't get the same. For the solution, a list of popular journals was added to an intranet that our institution maintained. This allowed KID holders to save favorites, but it's not comprehensive and it requires manually updating links when they change. Think a basic SharePoint list of journals. That is, if the broken links are even noticed, as it's outside our catalog and outside our everyday workflow. This wasn't an ideal solution, so we continued to push, which brought more attention to the issue. Partly it was the technology wasn't ready. It was also politics between institutions, and not having the time and resources to focus on the issue. The opportunity here was that attention was brought to the issue, and in 2022, the stars aligned. Primo offers multiple authentication options, and now they offered the ability to save favorites and pass searches. We were pushing and pushing for this capability and to turn it on, and by continuing to push for that login situation to change, we gained the support of the issue at our parent institution, and time has been made to focus on this project at both our libraries. You can see it here from our dev environment. It's currently on track for Go Live. And lastly, our parent organization moved to single sign-on with a specific vendor. This, of course, is with NetID only. We received notification one week before it went live. We scrambled to meet with the vendor and the parent institution to put in place a workaround solution. The impact was that our staff and our patrons were not prepared for the change, and we're still determining the fallout. 
The reactive solutioning is not ideal. It would have been better to have some notice. The solution was an IP-based option for EasyProxy that our KID holders can use. This solution offers read-only access, which meant that some of our patrons actually lost options for personalization, and unfortunately, some of them noticed. The opportunity here. It garnered necessary momentum in bridging the gap between the two identity management teams of both organizations, in addition to the two libraries. This has created new discussions on entitlements and access for our patrons and is making the teams confront issues of said access and entitlement that before have been ignored. If you work in a consortium, some of what I've presented on may have been familiar. Often, our access issues have been because of a lack of communication between product owners at our institutions or misunderstanding of all the implications involved, technical or otherwise. To manage communication between institutions and teams, we've set up quarterly meetings between our IT and library partners. We've created a working group between the library and identity management to resolve identity entitlement or access issues and to highlight issues as they arise. It's this fostering of relationships between these joint institutions and the multiple IT units and the two libraries that has been the most efficient way to improve access for our patrons. We're still working on the best methods to keep our focus front and center at the parent organization. We need to move ahead of reacting to problems, to anticipating potential issues. We need to function as a reliable resource for our patrons. Investing in how we solve for access will allow for a more efficient experience and will meet our patrons' needs. I hope that we are moving in the right direction. Time will tell, and hopefully so will our patrons. Thank you for listening. Hi, hey, Catherine. Thank you so much for that presentation. It's been really interesting seeing different connections between different presentations today. Um, and this one has made me think about a, a few of the other versions that we've seen of like, whoa, we didn't think about that whole swath of people that we should have thought about. Um, so if you have questions for Catherine, please uh, throw them in Slido um, as usual kill a little time while we wait for some questions to show up. Um, I know folks are getting getting a little pooped at the end of the day, but uh, it was a really, a really great presentation and very interesting for those of us in consortia who I'm sure can relate to decisions being made that have effects that um, nobody has anticipated, but perhaps they could have if they had asked <laughs> the right people. Um, so questions come in. Can you share the name of the SAML vendor that you went with? Uh, I wouldn't say that it was a, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. The SAML vendor, I, I, I think we're using Shibboleth. Is that what you mean? They probably won't, uh, we'll see if they throw in another question to confirm. Uh, Sarah will throw it in the, in the questions if it if it comes in um that's the the downside <laughs> of yeah. using uh, uh something like this um oh no it's it's not azure ad i think we're using oracle okay marvelous thank you i i mean part of the problem is because we we have two logins so we use whatever nyu uses and then we use what i'm more familiar with which is our langone oracle Anything else? Last, uh, yes. Have you considered Open Athens? We, we have, and it's not completely off the table. Um, it is a consideration. So, but what? But we're currently not using it. I guess I should say. Right. But I'm always welcome to hear of people's experiences. So if anyone wants to write me later and tell me pluses and minuses, I'm all ears. Fantastic. Thanks. Just give another moment to see if anything comes through. Okay. I think we're good. Thank you so much, Catherine. Great to see you. And uh, yeah, thank you for ending our, our access day. <laughs>
Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. So as I said, it's been interesting through the day and all the wide variety of presentations that Access always has to see that there are often through lines. And uh, it's a fun thing in a single stream conference to be able to sit and, and listen and think about those, those through lines and then talk about those through lines with, with other folks. Um, chatting on Zoom, if you like, uh, or perhaps at the social event tonight which will, I'll give you some details after we, uh, after we wrap up. We won't let, the Zoom people don't have to hear about all the fun we're going to have. <laughs> uh, so we will be back tomorrow morning, uh, starting at 9.15 with our keynote, Sean Graham. Um, again, we're asking for the in-person folks to stay masked for the keynote. Um, Breakfast for in-person people will be starting at uh, 8.45. So you can come on in and, and grab some breakfast and make yourselves comfortable, have a seat. Um, but live stream and Zoom will start at 9.15. So for online folks, that is the end of day one of Access Conference. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope we see you tomorrow. For our in-person friends, uh, we are convening tonight at Pub Italia. Um, I think our...